Solomon was given dominance over the 72 demons of hell. Then, later, Solomon trapped them in a fiery lake forever. Babylonians heard rumors that there were treasures bound in these fiery lakes and began to summon these 72 dark spirits, which are the... Yo, is he rounding up all the watchers and Naki? This is... What? You better lock this in is and buckle up because you're in for another creepy and scary TikTok reaction video. I'm Jet Ski Chuck, and on these dark waters, you better keep your head on a straight swivel. Hyper mode, activate. Engaging hyper mode. Warning, incoming. Warning. Activate evasive maneuver. Evasive Jet Ski Chuck, the quantum portal is destabilizing. You won't make it! Are you No! Jet Ski Chuck, did you make the did quantum you make leap? It just in time? Are you still there? Based on the data, I believe Jet went quantum. But we won't know till he reaches Dark Waters 9. Indicators show that the prototype reached 147% power capacity, indicating a leap was attempted. I just pray he reaches Dark Waters 9, but the return journey is the tricky part. So a lot of people are calling it like a UFO and whatnot. Aliens, man. And that's how the Bible describes certain angels. Pretty stunning resemblance, I'd say. Where did they get this? Looks like it was taken on a cell phone. Something called the Ark of Covenant. The wings remind me of the wings from Wonder Woman. They're like gold. Inside of it, they have Aaron's rod and a pot of manna. Um, it's basically the Ark of Covenant, and you know what happened in Tennessee with the Covenant School. They also had like the breastplate worn by Aaron, the elder of Moses, the priestly breastplate, which reminds me of like a phone number if you're trying to communicate. It says in order to communicate with God, when you call on cell phone with some digits, use your birthday decode, your own birthday is digits to communicate on a landline or a lead line with God or whatever person you might call God, Allah, you know, the most high, whatever, the most high. So yeah, do you know, when you ask the digits for a girl, just ask for her birthday instead of like her phone number, because you'll find out a lot more. So Aaron's rod was in the Ark of the Covenant. It's wild because that reminds me of, what was it? Uh, Psalms 23, three. When he speak of Rod. Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. No matter how dark the time is, you will. That rod and thy staff comfort me. So when they're talking about Rod and Staff, you know, is this the same one in the art? You know, it's just quick correlation, I see. Get through it. You will conquer it. Because you are a warrior of God. And they say, well, we have the, we have the Ark of the Covenant here. <laughs> covenant. And you've got the Ark of the Covenant here? I've just seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know? mm -hmm. You've got the Ark of the Covenant here? <laughs> Where? And they, and they said, well, it's in that enclosure. And there's a huge religious enclosure in the heart of Axon which contains a 16th century church, Church of St. Mary of Zion, and beside it a little chapel. And it's in that chapel that the Ethiopians claim the Ark is kept. I never saw the object that is called the Ark itself, and, and maybe um, that's just as well, because the, the guardians <laughs> of the Ark get sick and die very, very rapidly. He said that people come out with... These monks have a very short lifespan. Typically, once they're appointed, they don't live more than two or three years. The Ark is kept in a sanctuary chapel in the grounds of the oldest Christian place of worship in Africa, the Church of St. Mary of Zion. And when I asked the Guardian about what was causing his blindness, he said it was the Ark that was doing it to him. And looking at me through these clouded eyes of his, he said the Ark is a thing of fire. And I do believe that Ethiopians do have that object. The So my initial thoughts are, can I compare this?
this to the biblical descriptions of the ark? Is this the real one? The first thing I notice is no cherubim on the top. They're not carrying it like the Levites carry it. Also, it looks smaller. I, don't, I think it would be a lot heavier if it had the tab, two tablets in. The guy's balancing it on his head. Does this church guard the Ark of the Covenant? The Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion in Ethiopia was first built in the 4th century AD. It has been said that within its walls is a chapel that supernaturally protects the Ark of the Covenant covenant, an object of incredible magical power and biblical lore, capable of bringing entire armies to their knees, and is said to be one of the most sacred objects in all religious lore. Within the inner sanctum of this chapel is a guardian monk, someone who is chosen for life to be the only one who may directly interact with the Ark. This process is something that has been done for generations, with a new guardian successor chosen for a lifetime appointment, confined within the chapel's walls. Strangely, each guardian monk is said to contract cataracts when his time to become the guardian draws near. That is why the question must be asked. The Ark of the Covenant. All right, so. Ethiopia is a possible possibility of it being there. Another possibility of the Ark being somewhere is at the Vatican archives. So, questions are, is the Ark of the Covenant at the Vatican archives? Question number two, why is a cherubim on top of the Ark? Like the cherubim is guarding it. What really is a cherubim is a question I would like to ask. And why would they put a cherubim on the top of the Ark of the Covenant? Like the cherubim is the ultimate protector. What created the cherubim? Something that powerful can, can guard it? and everything else gets sick around it? That is interesting. Let me know your thoughts below. We're gonna dive deeper on this. What exactly, what exactly is inside, inside the, Ark the Ark of the Covenant? Covenant. So, it so it talks about, about what it contains in a handful of verses, verses but in Hebrews Hebrew chapter 9 verse 4, it says it has a golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod, and also the tablets of the covenant. And these tablets are the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses and written literally by the finger of God. And the Ark of the Covenant is so sacred that when Uzzah the Levite went to save it from falling, God struck him down as soon as he touched it. And to this day, we don't really know where the Ark of the Covenant is, and I think God is actually hiding it so that people don't start worshiping it and turning it into an idol. Be sure to subscribe for more videos. See, if we look at this, the chair is a cherubim on top. Huh, this is fascinating. I didn't know the Ten Commandments actually had was written by God, the literal finger. Wow. So apparently Ron Garcia has seen the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments on it has proof to show us. Listen is the to Ark what he's about the to say. Real? 100%. And we know exactly where it's at. Where is it? In the Vatican. Interesting. Have I been in the Vatican? Yes, sir. Did they let me in the back room? Of course. Can, can, all right, can you give me some validation here? Yes, because everybody thinks I'm lying here. Literally, literally, and they let me in the back room. This is what happened. This is how I, I was able to get into the back room, because everybody always says I'm lying. I was in the I Vatican, just like anybody else. People started crowding me in the Vatican. One of the, the, the security, or I guess one of the, the higher ups in the Vatican noticed. I said, can I need some help. There's a lot of people. I'm going to let him finish, but I'm just going to let you guys know. I don't even know who this dude is. Like, I see Ryan Garcia everywhere. You know, I didn't get into the video for, for entertainment purposes because I don't know who he is. Like, I literally have no idea who Ryan Garcia is. Um, So that's why I didn't, 
you know, jump in. And I didn't plan on, I'm just on these dark waters. I didn't even plan on mentioning, you know, Ryan Garcia, but it looks like he's popping up on the Ark of the Covenant. So let's see what he's got talking about. A lot of people crowded me. They let me in the back room. They liked my personality. So they start showing me everything. everything. My guess, he's a famous streamer, uh, Fortnite player, or, uh, yeah, he's either a streamer or Fortnite player. I, I couldn't tell you who he is. That's just by how he's talking and how I'm just seeing it. That's just my initial reaction of who Ryan Garcia is. Again, I have no idea. <laughs> The robes. The He's not lying. Jewel, He's not lying. All right. So here's the proof. We were in Israel proof. in June. And BB, one of BB's boys, texted me. He said, hey, brother, good morning. I spoke with the Prime Minister BB Netanyahu. He would like to meet Ryan. Facts right here. Y'all can screenshot it. I don't know if y'all can see so it. Screenshot it. That's facts. That so for all y'all saying he's crazy for that, reason. this actually happened. It so happened. now if the Ark of the Covenant is real, that means the Ten Commandments are real. And they, I remember what Ron Garcia said when he first started coming out saying all this stuff. Is everything that he's saying, he got proof to back it up. Y'all let me know what y'all think about Ron Garcia saying the Ark of the Covenant in the comments. Like and follow for more wisdom and stay tuned. Yeah, it's definitely getting biblical out here. 12 miles west of Jerusalem, archaeology. Yeah, I don't even know who he is, but it looks like he's uh, famous though. Archaeologists found this biblically accurate stone matching the description of the Ark of the Covenant. Ron Wyatt was working on a biblical excavation of the area when he discovered not only the Ark of the Covenant, but the actual crucifixion site of Jesus Christ. In the location that the Ark was found, Wyatt noticed a crack above the cave and a substance that had spilled all over the mercy seat of the Ark. After taking it to be tested in a lab, they discovered the DNA was still alive and that the Ark was buried directly beneath the crucifixion site, proving that this blood could have been that of Jesus during the crucifixion. They discovered that the DNA showed 24 chromosomes from only the maternal parent proving that Jesus was born to a virgin. that is true what she just said then it could be possible it could be at the vatican did you know that the ark of the covenant has actually been found this is crazy because the ark literally holds the ten commandments that moses did you know that the ark of the covenant has actually been found this is crazy because the ark literally holds the ten commandments that moses got from god and this all started because of a video by a guy called kevin cash whose goal in life is to make it known that the ark of the covenant has been found and there's many people who debate this and get grumpy about it but the biblical backing that he uses is just unbelievable check this so it starts back on january 6 1982 where a man by the name of ron wyatt says he discovered not only the ark of the covenant but the actual crucifixion site of jesus christ he was doing biblical excavation when he found this small cave and he went through it to make a long story short he ends up finding this golden box with a cracked lid and a cracked ceiling through the entire mountain to the top with this hole in it he also found a dark dry substance on the top of the mercy seat of the ark and he actually passed out when he realized it was blood because according to the Old Testament in order to fulfill the law, the blood of the sacrifice must be applied to the mercy seat. And if Jesus was a sacrifice, then according to the law, his blood had to be applied. Ark of the Covenant was a power plant device. We know this based on the descriptions in the Bible. And it's been replicated at two different universities by two different groups of people and it generated so much power they had to shut it down. Just based on the biblical information and instructions. When you take those measurements, it fits directly inside that box. And why did it fit in the box? Because the pyramid at some point had lost its ability to generate the maximum amount of power. And so that was needed to add an extra piece to fix the problem. And that's exactly what they did. Then the energy would shoot up through the apex. The obelisks are all made of crystal granite. What Even do you mean the, the obelisk? What you is know, that? those giant stones that stand up with the points at the top? Okay. Those are obelisks. Okay. They're all around the region. We have one at the White House, right? You know? 
We have one in Rome at the, in the center courtyard there. They took them and put them all around. The one in, in, in Washington is obviously it's man-made, but the other ones all around the world are all come from out of Egypt. But what's interesting is those obelisks, they capture the ambient electricity from the atmosphere. There has to be some type of middle ground, some type of correlation in between the ancient Egyptian technology and what the actually the Ark of the Covenant had. The covenant is likely hidden away at the Vatican or at the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion. There have been two major going theories in the Jewish community as to where the Ark of the Covenant is. One of them is that it's buried in the Temple Mount somewhere. They, the, the Jews saw the Romans coming and they're like, we are squirreling this away and the easiest place to put this is like somewhere underneath here, mm. which has been a going theory for a very long time. Uh, and then the secondary theory is that you guys have it. The, and, in the, at the Vatican? It's at the Vatican. Really? Uh, yeah, because, it, because there have been long-standing rumors that the Vatican inherited much of the wealth of the Roman Empire. And so after the fall of Judea, a lot of that stuff ended up being kept by the Catholic Church. Because it's like you look, you go into the museums and you're like, oh, there's that, uh, you know, Raphael painting. But like, I don't know, man, you got the Ark of the Covenant, you're probably putting that in like the, like the special locker. If somebody were to have it, the Catholics aren't a horrible bet, considering that when you go through Rome, one of my favorite things is where it's just like a giant Egyptian obelisk, and then boom, stick a cross on it, it's like, this is ours now. The Covenant is one of the most mysterious relics from history. It was thought to carry the Ten Commandments, but it may have had another purpose. In 586 AD, the Ark of the Covenant was lost when the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed. So what was the Ark of the Covenant's true purpose? In a past video, I explained how the Pyramid of Giza could have been an ancient power generator. I theorized how the giant obelisks that used to cover Egypt could have been the power grids. But where were the batteries? It's thought that the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid of Giza had a holding place for a sarcophagus. But what if it was for something else? What if that's where the Ark or Arks of the Covenant were charged? According to ancient Hebrew texts, there are stories of people that got too close to the Ark and got injured or even killed, as if it were electrified. If only there were some modern technology that could support this theory. There is. Introducing the Leyden Jar, an early capacitor for storing electricity. It was first created by taking a glass bottle and coating the inside and outside of it with a conductive metal foil. The mouth of the jar had a metal rod protruding from it. That created a positive charge on the inside of the jar and a negative charge on the outside of the jar. Think about it. The Ark was a wooden box instead of a glass jar. It was coated on the inside and outside with gold instead of conductive foil. The gold statues on top of the Ark acted as the metal rod. In 1961, a team of college researchers from the University of Minnesota tried to recreate the Ark, but had to stop and destroy their work because of the uncontrollable electric charge that it created. Was the Ark of the Covenant a religious relic, or was it the first battery? I think it was both. For entertainment purposes only, don't come for me. But yeah, it's, man, it could have been both. Except this battery was on another level. But Moses' staff as well, you know? It got you thinking about, like, what really was Moses' staff? Out of doubt, I, I believe it was real. The art, Moses' the staff, everything. There's, there's too many correlations. There's too many stories of it lining right up, being told in just a different way. Um, but yeah, powerful. But one thing that's interesting. One thing that's extremely interesting to me is Aaron's breastplate. Where is that? At? Who's got Aaron's breastplate? All right. When I type in Aaron's breastplate, this is what I get. Now, they said you had to wear one of these. And you were actually carrying the art just to protect you, you know? Um, where is this at now is my question. So we can get a better understanding of the type of technology 
that they had going. Let's see if we can find something. All right, I did find this. This just says mysterious onyx found in Jerusalem. Could this be one of the gems put on the breastplate? It could be a possibility. Um, they could have been carrying this around. You see it's in some type of, looks like, is that straw or wood? I don't know. Um, but could it hold the electricity charge and protect somebody? I don't know. Um, but yeah, this could definitely be one of the stones that they might have inserted into that breastplate or armor. It might have not just been a breastplate. They could have had some technological armor they would have had to put on to protect them. I don't know. This is all speculation at this point. There is another uh, replica, but this this got English on it. This definitely isn't a, a real artifact. I would be interested to know where's the real one at. Everyone's like, where's the Ark of the Covenant? You know, um, y'all asking, y'all been asking that question for a while. We need to ask some new questions. Where's Aaron's breastplate at? What happened to Moses' staff? Um, what type of technology were they using to um, DNA encode these animals? Um, we need to ask some new questions. This we might be getting somewhere. This this might be this looks more authentic, like an authentic, you know, breastplate of Aaron that they would have to use. One of these videos said they use this to communicate. You know, your guys' thoughts below. This is interesting. This looks like a drawing, but you know, they showing it more like a armor, which could have a little bit more validity. When they're trying to carry the art, you know, your guys are thoughts below. Let me know what you guys think about this. All right. This one's interesting. Um, can't really read it, but definitely could have been used for some type of communication. So, of course, having conversations about what would be considered a culture known by a few amount of individuals is all. So, of course, having conversations about what would be considered a culture known by a few amount of individuals is always an interesting thing to get into. So, of course, having conversations about what would be considered a culture known by a few amount of individuals is always an interesting thing to get into with people and of course create video content on. But one specific thought that I've had for several years now, especially based on what I've learned about Ether and Antiquitech, Red Mercury, Tartaria, and a lot of what would we be called in the truther community lost knowledge, it's led me and a lot of other individuals as well in conversation to an understanding that the potentiality for what we know is the Ark of the Covenant was more than just the mercy seat or holy of holies, if you would, in the place where once a year man would commune with the Most High, but also having what would be known to us as Antiquitech properties in the sense of it potentially being a battery. Let's continue with some more imagery. So at face value, just bringing it up randomly in conversation, it might sound like a completely ridiculous notion, especially if you're not even familiar with what Antiquitech actually is or antiquity technology of the past, which I've obviously dropped content on before and talk about all the time. But when looking at potential architectural uh, aspects of what is given to Solomon's temple, it's easy to see how tying it in with ethereal, which just means more perfect than our world, energy, which is why we call it ether, is it's easy to see that these spires would be all connected to this entire building structure, uh, 
bringing in the life energy of literally the world around us in to the building itself being used as a piece of electrical electrical equipment and going going in tandem with the ark of the covenant itself to create endless energy it's also important to note that the holy of holies is also depicted with a lot of gold within it so it's easy to see how the electrical aspect could be included in this type of topic here because obviously gold it, uh, if you're familiar uh, it, it is a fantastic conductor of electricity itself. So that goes into the aspect of um, being extremely careful when one is in the room, of course, being in the presence of the Most High, but also maybe for other uh, ramifications of free energy flowing out. I think it's fascinating having these types of conversations, and I'm always welcome to hearing comments down below. So uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Thanks. You guys want to check him out? That is Fallout Truth again with another interesting point that was I was thinking myself. Your guys' thoughts below, but he did point out something that made me think. Could it be possible that if the Ark was more than just this holy relic, and it also and it also had some type of ancient technology with it. Instead of charging the pyramids, could it charge Solomon's temple? I didn't even know Solomon had a temple. Do we know where that's at? Let me type that in. I'm not familiar on Solomon's temple. But could the Ark of the Covenant been there for a little bit, maybe? Let's see what they say. I see these waters are getting dark going into Solomon's temple. So you guys need to lock in and buckle up because we're going even deeper on these dark waters. We had to jump into the submersible. We had to get off the jet ski and get into the submersible on this episode because we're going even deeper. We found out that the Ark of the Covenant wasn't just power and pyramids. It was power and different stuff. Possibly Solomon's temple. What does Solomon's temple have to do with it? Why is there chair beams on the top of the Ark of the Covenant? What type of technology did the Ark of the Covenant have? We're going to dive even deeper on this video. We're going submersible. Oxygen levels. Okay, we're good. Let's go, y'all. ...have been destroyed by the Neo-Babylonians because they hated the Jews and they just wanted to hurt them. So they tore down the Temple of Solomon. And when they read the, the Bill of Rights, they go... Hey, uh, can we get a new Temple of Solomon? Korosh is like, yes, of course. Everybody gets their temples rebuilt. And he said, okay, yeah, show me the plans. And let's just say they added stuff from the original temple. For example, they built a giant human-made mesa and then put the second Temple of Solomon on top. And so Korosh is looking at it and he goes, wait, what? That's... That's a, that's like a mountain, a flat mountain. The Babylonians tore that down? I don't even know how anybody built it, let alone tore it down. And Jews are like, yeah, they really hated us. And so Kurosh goes, well, I, we're going to do it. We promised you we'd do it. We're going to build it. But I only know one people on earth that can build mountains. It'll be Persian gold, but it's going to be Egyptian engineers. And they went and grabbed Egyptian engineers and they built the Temple Mount with Persian gold. And that's why Kurosh is in the Bible. <laughs> the Temple Mount is where King Solomon built the first temple in the year 957 BC. And later, Jews built the second temple in the year 352 BC. The Christians also built a church named after St. Mary of Justinian in the year 561 CE all of which happened before the al Mosque or the Dome of the Rock were built. No disrespect. Hold on. The Temple Mount is...
when we're looking at that, tell me that's not Tartarian built. Is that that? Isn't that that Moorish Tartarian technology? I'm gonna write these names down. Allah Ask Mosk. Yeah, we're gonna find out about that mosque. We're gonna type in that one. Saint Mary. Are these real buildings that are that are still up? Can these possibly be charged by the art? We're looking at all these Tartarian buildings. We don't know that if we go deep underground. All these all old Tartarian buildings. There could be a battery spot. Oh, uh, this is getting deep. Indian in the year. Everybody can't trap a gin. There's probably very few, few sorcerers that really know the science of trapping a gin. The only real people that know the science of trapping a gin is his own family. So if Solomon was a real person, if Solomon was a real person, and the legend goes that Solomon built his temple with the help of demons and jinn, right? He was such a powerful sorcerer, he was able to build a temple of God with jinn, right? And demons, then y'all need to really think about that. But then again, Solomon wasn't real. So what does that story really say? It's a metaphor, right? Of how you build your spiritual body. Because genes are also genes. The genes in your body. Right? The genes, the genius comes from your genes. The genes in your body. Right? So when you talk about gen, you're also talking about, on a metaphysical level, talking about the, the genes in your body. So when you're talking about melanin, you're talking about carbon. Or demons, excuse me. When you're talking about demons, you're talking about carbon. The carbon in your body. The life force. And he was able to build the temple of God, which is your higher self, your higher body. That's not no secret. That's all over YouTube. People talk about that. The Temple of Solomon was modeled after the Tabernacle of Moses. Because of the many similarities between the Tabernacle and the Garden of Eden, many scholars believe that the Garden of Eden was the prototype for the Tabernacle, and thus later temples. According to Jewish tradition, Eden was located on a hill, with the Tree of Life and the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil at the center of the hill. The Bible teaches that when Adam and Eve transgressed and partook of the forbidden fruit, they were cast out towards the east. Cherubim and a flaming sword were then placed at the east entrance to prevent... These cherubim are real. Did you see how they prop those things up in a flaming sword? I don't want no smoke with no flaming sword or cherubim. I'm sorry. Bent them from partaking of the tree of life, as they would then live forever in their sin. In order to return back into the presence of God, Israel had to symbolically retrace the steps of Adam and Eve, passing the cherubim and re-entering the garden in a westward direction. The tabernacle was set up in the same east-to-west progression, seeming to replicate the Garden of Eden. The tabernacle was divided into three main courts, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. The outer court represented the fallen world, while the inner courts represented a more sacred and holier way of life. In essence, as the priest, who represented all of Israel, progressed through the tabernacle, or temple, he left the world to enter a more holy state, and then was enabled to re-enter the presence of the Lord, passing the angels, or cherubim, who were embroidered on the veil. Solomon's temple replicated this same three-level progression, doubling the floor plan size of the tabernacle sanctuary for the temple structure. All right, y'all. One thing that comes to mind when we're mentioning the Naki, uh, Watchers, uh, whatever you want to call them, this Ark of the Covenant, how many of them were there? There couldn't have been no more than three or there could have only been one. So that's another question. Was there only one or was there multiple? Um, but it, it was definitely something that couldn't have been made more than 
more is where I'm trying to get at. This isn't something that I believe the watchers of the Naki couldn't make is what I'm trying to say. Um, but we're going to dive into that. How many? How is it made? Is that even something I can ask? How is the Ark of the Covenant made? Is that something I can say? This is indeed dark waters. Oxygen levels. We had to get off the jet ski. Now we're in the submersible. You know, we was in the submersible for I feel like two months already. Now I had to jump right back in it. You know, these waters get deep. I thought I could just cruise on the jet ski all day, have fun. No, we had to go back in these deep waters, man. This is never ending. We get one question answered. Three more questions arise from that one answer. So it's like we're getting answers, but we're getting more questions. That's what's going on on these waters. Our reality is constantly shifting. We have to go through quantum fluxes just to act like we're somewhat coherent from the multiple reality shifting. We have to go through quantum fluxing just to be coherent for a little bit. You know, we shouldn't have to be quantumly fluxing every, you know. But we're, all right, let's get back onto these chair beams. Chair beams. How many arcs were there? Is that something I could even ask? And what was it made out of? What many people don't know about the biblical figure Solomon is that he was an employer of demons to build his temple. God gave him power to discern what is. What many people don't know about the biblical figure Solomon is that he was an employer of demons to build his temple. God gave him power to discern what is good and what is evil and gave him great knowledge with this power that he had dominance over demons and the demons were subject to him. One of his workers was a young boy. However, when the boy would sleep at night, a demon would come in and steal half of his money and half of his food and would have dominance over the boy. Solomon asked him, why is it that you were paid so well, yet you become skinnier and skinnier as the days go on? And the boy told him, there is a demon that visits me at night and steals my food and my pay. Solomon said, bring this demon to me. Take this ring and tell him that I commanded him to come see me. The boy did as he said. The demon's name was Ornius, and he came to the foot of the temple. I need his name. We know about Mammon, but I need this one. That I commanded him to come see me. The boy did as he said. And skinnier as the days go on. And the boy told him, there is a demon that visits me at night and steals my food and my pay. Solomon said, bring this demon to me. Take this ring and tell him that I commanded him to come see me. The boy did as he said. The demon's name was Ornius. And he came to the foot of the temple where Solomon was waiting for him. Solomon boldly walked up to the demon and said, Why is it that you torment my workers? Who is your leader? I want you to bring him to me at once. So Ornius went to Beelzebub, the leader of all the demons and told him that Solomon summons him. But Beelzebub, having heard him, said to him, Who is this Solomon that you speak of, Ornius? Ornius simply threw the ring at Beelzebub and said, Come and see for yourself. Beelzebub shot out a big flame and a fire followed. When Solomon saw Beelzebub, he, he praised God and said to Beelzebub, Who are you? Beelzebub replied, I am king of all the demons. Solomon demanded that he sit next to him on his throne. Beelzebub promised to bring to Solomon all the spirits under his rule. Solomon asked Beelzebub if there were any female spirits under his rule. Beelzebub replied, yes, 
and Solomon demanded to see them quickly. Beelzebub left and brought back a demon named Ono Skelly, who had the body of a woman and yet the legs of a goat. Solomon asked Ono Skelly, tell me about yourself. She said, those that worship my star, either in private or openly, don't know that they harm themselves and fuel my appetite for mischief. If they give me proper worship, I might give them a little money as reward for those that worship me fairly. Solomon replied, what is your star, Ono Skelly? She said, the full moon. Ono Skelly said she was born from the words of a man uttering an echo in the woods. And Solomon asked, what angel do you fear? She replied, the spirit that dwell within you. Later, Solomon was given dominance over the 72 demons of hell. Then, later, Solomon trapped them in a fiery lake forever. Babylonians heard rumors that there were treasures bound in these fiery lakes and began to summon these 72 dark spirits, which are the Yo, is he rounding up all the watchers and Naki? This is what? This is it. He's rounding them all up. The lake of fire, ring of fire. This is it. This is a super gem. Same spirits you see depicted on some of the walls of Egypt and the dark spirits of human entities. Did you guys hear that? Type in the comments your thoughts below. Did you hear that? We're running this back. Facts of Israel. Did you know? I'm sorry. Facts of What many people. Yo, this video was lit. What about that ring? He said he threw the ring back at him. What? Y'all, this one was crazy. It's... This was the validity. It explains so much. There's so much cross-referencing going on in this video. It explains a lot. Where have we heard about the ring of fire, lake of fire? Huh? Where have we heard that before? What many people don't know about the biblical figure Solomon is that he was an employer of demons to build his temple. God gave him power to discern what is good and what is evil and gave him how does he know this? How does the narrator know this? What type of manuscript? What type of story? What type of acolyte written documentation did he get this information from? In great knowledge with this power that he had dominance over demons and the demons were subject to him. One of his workers was a young boy. However, when the boy would sleep at night, a demon would come in and steal half of his money and half of his food, and would have dominance over the boy. Solomon asked him, why is it that you were paid so well, yet you become skinnier and skinnier as the days go on? And the boy told him, there is a demon that visits me at night and steals my food and my pay. Solomon said, bring this demon to me, Take this ring and tell him that I commanded him to come see me. The boy did as he said. The demon's name was Ornius, and he came to the foot of the temple where Solomon was waiting for him. Solomon boldly walked up to the demon and said, Why is it that you torment my workers? Who is your leader?
people say Solomon wasn't real. You know, I think he was. Let me know your guys' thoughts below. Was he real or was he wasn't? Was was is it fiction or not? Let me know. Was he a real person or or was he a metaphor? People are trying to say, you know. I want you to bring him to me at once. So Ornius went to Beelzebub, the leader of all the demons, and told him that Solomon. Where have we heard Beelzebub before? Was he not in a good book? We're going to find it right after this video. The correlation, the cross-referencing is key. He summons him. But Beelzebub, having heard him, said to him, Who is this Solomon that you speak of, Ornius? Ornius simply threw the ring at Beelzebub and said, Come and see for yourself. How did he knew he threw the ring? Like, this is a, a great story. How does he, where is this written? What type of lost, forgotten book is this from? Is this in the New Testament or the Old Testament? Is it in a lost book? Let me know. Beelzebub shot out a big flame and a fire followed. When Solomon saw Beelzebub, he, he praised God and said to Beelzebub, Who are you? Beelzebub replied, I am king of all the demons. Solomon demanded that he sit next to him on his throne. Beelzebub promised to bring to Solomon all the spirits under his rule. Solomon asked Beelzebub if there were any female spirits under his rule. Beelzebub replied, yes, and Solomon demanded to see them quickly. Beelzebub left and brought back a demon named Onoskeli, who had the body of a woman and yet the legs of a goat. Solomon asked on oh, no skelly on that <laughs> no skelly tell me about yourself she said those that worship my star either in private or openly don't know that they harm themselves and fuel my appetite for mischief if they give me proper worship i might give them a little money as reward for those that worship me fairly solomon replied what is your star onoskeli she said the full moon onoskeli said she was born from the words of a man uttering an echo in the woods and an echo in the woods. Run that back. No Skelly said, said she was born, born from the words, words of, a of a man uttering an echo in the woods. Born from a man echoing in the woods. Now, I'm just piecing, I'm just putting the pieces together here. That's all I'm doing. If she was born from a man that was echoing from the woods, doesn't that sound like the beginning of Genesis when he literally spoke everything into existence? So she's saying that, you know, the spirit is tied to the moon or whatever, but could it be possible this was born during Genesis? Just throwing this out there. Just throwing that out there. Because that's the first thing that came to my mind. Like, you born from a man echoing in the woods. What does woods even translate? Like, if this is actual scripture or text, can it be translated back to its original meaning and possibly Paleo Hebrew? Um, even Latin or Greek, we, we probably we can get some context from it, but I prefer Paleo Hebrew. Um, what what does woods, what does the word woods actually mean in Paleo Hebrew? It could mean you know, void and empty. For all I know, 
but that is interesting. And Solomon asked, what angel do you fear? She replied, the spirit that dwell within you. Mm -hmm. Y'all know what that is, that spirit that dwells in you. That Ruach. Later, Solomon was given dominance over the 72 demons of hell. Then, later, Solomon trapped them in a fiery lake forever. Babylonians heard rumors that there were treasures bound in these fiery lakes and began to summon these 72 dark spirits which are the same spirits you see depicted on some of the walls of Egypt and the dark spirits of human entities. So Solomon could be the key to this whole Egyptian dark madness going on. I know a lot of people rock with the Egyptians, but it looks like Solomon was key to all this. For him to summon the 72 dark entities, he's showing you right here what all of them are. And I know in the Tablets of Thoth, they talk about going, what was it? Damn, in the Emerald, Emerald Tablets of Thoth, there was a location. Hold on, we're gonna find it. This is important because this cross reference is a slash. Sit tight. This is this is fire. What I'm about to do. All right. Uh, hold on. Thank God. Made a huge correlation. Emerald tablets of thought. Locations. There's a location in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth that starts with the M. And this could be possibly where they're trapped. Doors leading to truth. There it is. He who talks does not know. He who knows does not talk. The highest knowledge. Okay. I found it. The Halls of Adamante. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that where King Solomon locked them all up? The halls of Adamante. Uttering an echo in the woods. And Solomon asked, What angel do you fear? She replied, The spirit that dwell within you. That has to be that's that sounds straight out the book. I'm gonna be honest with you guys. Cause he asked her, what do you fear? She said the same spirit that dwells in you and who created her. It sounds like the, the words echoing when the sun and moon, when the greater light and the lesser light in Genesis, that's probably when it got created and they might've attached. I don't know, but I'm just putting the pieces together. So that's, those are two contexts that go together. Later, Solomon was given dominance over the 72 demons of hell. Then, later, Solomon trapped them in a fiery lake forever. Babylonians heard rumors that there were treasures bound in these fiery lakes and began to summon these 72 dark spirits, which are the same, same spirits sp you see depicted on some of the walls of Egypt and the dark spirits of human entities. Now, in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, they talk about the halls of Adamante. This is where I believe these 72 spirits got locked up. You know, so they talk about astro projecting and all that. This is the only way they could possibly escape the halls of Adamante slash the same place. Halls of Adamante is just their names are just being specific. Facts of Israel. Did you know? You guys, like, uh, you know, that was a long one. We, we put together the pieces, but honestly, let me know your guys' thoughts below. You know, could uh, if you guys know anything about the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, if not, we're going to play a little bit of something now. But in the 
Emerald Tablets of Thoth, they talk about a place called the Halls of Adamante. Could it be possible that the Halls of Adamante is actually hell? And those are the 72 spirits that got trapped. Man, that's a hey, that was a fire video. Pure fire. We need context and manuscripts and we need to cross reference what we just found so we can have some validity. That's all I'm saying for entertainment purposes only. Let's get back on these waters. Y'all made me hop back on the jet ski. We went to submersible to jet ski. Now going back into submersible. All right, we back in the submersible, man. We was hopping everywhere. Y'all got me. Man, in these waters is getting dark. Solomon. That could be the, the pivoting point to all this Egyptian, you know, stuff that's going on nowadays. Hiram Abiff. Hiram Abiff is accredited as the chief architect who worked alongside Hiram of Tyre. Hiram Abiff is not directly mentioned in either the Bible or the Torah, but we do have mention of Hiram of Tyre in the first book of Kings or the second book of Samuel. Masonic legend tells the story as follows. The construction of the temple is very long and strenuous. Hiram Abiff was demanded to reveal his esoteric knowledge as a master mason in order to expedite the process of the construction. When he refused to do so, he was killed in cold blood. This legend is seen as a ultimate expression of courage and solidarity, and Freemasons look to emulate this behavior. So much so that upon initiation, these events are routinely reenacted by members of the organization. And I just so happened to see a video the other day which shows this process. So here's that. And Mr. Hiram Biff would like to give you the secrets of a master mason instantly, or I will take your life. I see this as a very interesting example of how scripture continues to shape the course of humanity and will continue to do so until the end of our day. Solomon. Solomon is known for. And we're done with that one. Let's continue on these waters. Being the king of Israel who built the first temple in Jerusalem. He was also the second, after his father David, and last king of a unified Israel, which was at the height of its power during his reign. He is known for stories told in the Bible. He was called the wisest king in the Bible. So you might be thinking, why was this man called the wisest king in the Bible? Well, it was written in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 4 to 5. God said, ask, what shall I give thee? And instead of asking for gold, silvers, women, and lands, he asked for something that gave him the name wisest king in the Bible. He asked for wisdom. Solomon's temple, the temple of the soul, soul of man's temples. We have two temples, Ra, the Divine Masculine, Isis, the Divine Feminine. Together, in balancing these two energies through the electrical charge, you, through love, you get Israel, Israel, Israel. You know, if you look at this chart, you can see clearly that it says Alpha Point, and at the top, you have Omega Point. And we're all familiar with the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Your alpha point would be the contracted state of mind. And the emotions that go with the contracted state of mind is shame, guilt, apathy, grief, fear, desire, pride, ego. You know, you could truly say if someone's operating out of the divine masculine only, they're in the contracted state of mind. The I am, I feel, I do keep the expanded state of mind you get the acceptance the reason the love the joy the peace the enlightenment the omega point the ultimate consciousness connection to your higher self and source that would be the divine feminine you know, a lot of people question why they're here what their purpose is you see and our purpose was always to go from our old animalistic ways 
into our higher selves and connection to source to go from the contracted state of mind to the expanded state of mind. We didn't come from monkeys for entertainment purposes only don't come for me. To go from our alpha point to the omega point. To go from the Old Testament, the Old Testament, the old way of seeing things and doing things to the New Testament, the New Testament, the new way of doing things and the new way of seeing things. You know, and as I said before, love brings all these things together, three to five. You notice how we have seven chakras and love sits at the center. Love is the bridge, like Jesus was, right? That brings all these things together from the physical to the spiritual. Heaven and hell is nothing but a state of consciousness, energy. You understand? You know, this picture is a great example of what it's like when you step into love as opposed to when you're living in fear. Love, the electromagnetic field is 5,000 times greater than fear. Your auric field expands, your magnetism increases. You see? Fear does nothing but lower your frequency, creates disorder and discoherence, lowers the immune function, ignites stress, stress and disease, activates less DNA coding, and shortens telomeres. That's it. Everything lies within y'all. Realize the electrical... Solomon's temple really stood there, huh? We could definitely see the Tartarian ancient structure. People are trying to say demons built it, man. Just summon demons up whenever you needed something built. That's wild. Yo, yo, what's going on, everybody? Peace and blessings. So look, check this out, right? Now, we all, some of us are all already familiar with the Book of Enoch, and we know that the Book of Enoch talks about the fallen angels coming down and uh, intermingling with the daughters of men and bringing forth giants and things of that nature. But it's a lot of missing pieces to that puzzle, man. The giants did not only just come down and intermingle with the daughters of men and bring forth giants, but they also tampered with everything on the earth. They tempered with the animals, they tempered with everything, and they brought forth these mythological creatures. They brought forth these monsters, per se. You see what I'm saying? So they got you thinking everything is a myth. The world is everything is a myth, but everything that's a myth is actually the truth. Now let's get into it. Let's go. All right, so this is the Book of Giants. Now the Book of Giants was removed from the Bible. It was removed for a reason. Now let's read. I'm going to skip down a few chapters. So it says, the messengers who observed all the creatures on earth, including human beings, everything that the earth produced, the great fish, the sky with all that grew, and fruit of the earth, and all kinds of grain, and all the trees, and beasts, and reptiles, all the creeping things on the earth, they observed all, and every harsh deed and utterance, male and female among humans. Here we go. The messenger chose 200 specimens from each of the variety of creatures on which to perform ungodly acts. 200 donkeys, 200 mules, 200 rams of flock, 200 goats, 200 beasts of the field. From every animal, from every bird, for interbreeding. Giants, monsters, corruption filled the earth as a result of angelic interbreeding. Now, as y'all can see right here, now if you look at this picture right here, this statue right here, what do you see? You see half human, half horse. Why would they draw these? Why would they scope this out? This was literally what was going on during the times of Enoch, during the times, during the days of Noah. See, they put it right in our face. See, the fallen angels came down and not just uh, intermingled, you know what I'm saying, with the daughters of men, but they also intermingled, you know what I'm saying, and genetically modified the animals and humans. You see what I'm saying? Look, look at this, man. Hold on, I got some more. But you think it's a myth, though, right? Look, see what I'm saying? Look, look at this. Come on, man. You think it's a myth, though? See what I'm saying? They put it right in our face. Hold on. Look, a lot of y'all love Egypt. A lot of y'all love Egypt. Why would they? This, this is not an allegory. This is not symbolism. This is literally what was going on during those times, during the days of Noah, during the times of Noah. It was literally half uh, human hybrids and animal hybrids um, amongst, you know saying, the people during the days of Noah. This is real shit, man. Come on. So everything is just allegory, huh? Everything is a myth, huh? Everything is just uh, symbolism there, huh? 
Yeah, right. Come on now. Come on now. Come on. If y'all see, come on, man. Come on now. We see it, man. This was not milk. This is not an allegory. This is not none of that shit. This is what literally was going on during the times of Noah. They genetically modified everything. They was tapping with everything. The fallen angels were wicked. Come on now. Come on now. It's right in our face. It's right in our face. On the pyramid walls of Egypt. Come on now. It's not a mask. It's not a mask. Come on now. Come on. Truth right in your face. They put it right in our face, man. Let's get it. Come on, man. Look at this. This is not allegory. This is not mythology. This is not symbolism. That was literally what was going on during those times. Come on. Keep... Y'all remember the TV show Hercules and other TV shows? They had these type of hybrids in their TV shows and Greek mythology. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. Come on, man. Come on now. We see it. It's right in our face. Come on now. Come on, man. Hybrids, man. Come on, man. This is hybrid. This is human animal hybrids. It was in our face the whole time. Come on. Come on now. Come on now. We keep going. Come on. It's right in our face. Human hybrids right in our face. Come on now. The human hybrids of ancient Greece. This was not mythology. This was really what was going on, man. This was we got the uh, satyrs. We got the satyrs. Man, there go those bull slash men. Man, is this what the Naki and the, um, or the Watchers, they had to be the same thing. Because when they talking about manipulating the DNA, could that be interbreeding? The pieces are lining up. Where's my note? No hoot. So we got the Naki. Or the Watchers. At this point, I'm convinced they the same thing. Whatever y'all want to call them, man. What's, that, what's lining up in that book and what the ancient Sumerians and what everyone's saying, they the same people that fell out of heaven. And then in a book of giants? What? How many of y'all read the book of giants? I haven't. But the fact that they go in detail talking about them actually editing the genes? What? They how long ago? They said this years ago. And the pieces are lining up. Book of Giants. Your thoughts below. These dark waters is getting deep. But the correlation and cross-referencing is key. I got a little storage pack on my jet ski right there. This is really what's going on. The fallen angels tampered with everything, man. They were genetically modifying everything the same way they're doing it right now in today's time where they genetically modifying mosquitoes and animals and cloning meat and things of that nature. We are living in the days of Noah. Y'all got to wake up. Wake up. Hey guys, this is Mike Chen. In a recent dig in Ethiopia, archaeologists have supposedly unearthed a long lost city once inhabited by giants. This city, located in Harla, Ethiopia, was unearthed by a team. Hey guys, this is Mike Chen. In a recent dig in Ethiopia, archaeologists have supposedly unearthed a long lost city once inhabited by giants. This city, located in Harla, Ethiopia, was unearthed by a team led by Timothy Insole from the Institute of Arabic and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter. Few people have conducted archaeological research in the region in the past, but most of their digs focused on finding ancient human remains. This time, scientists focused on finding ancient settlements that could possibly hint at the existence of giants in the city. According to locals in the area, there were numerous stories and legends of giants inhabiting the region in the past. The possible supporting evidence of such stories belongs in some of the buildings in the region. The buildings are made of stones that are so massive in size that only giants or people with supernormal strength could possibly have lifted them. Locals also mentioned that they have found old coins and, and pottery on a regular basis, all of which hinted at an ancient settlement that once existed in the area. Although our What's really going on in Ethiopia? They say the Book of Enoch actually came out of Ethiopia. And at one point, it actually had the Holy Grail. Can you believe that? 
archaeologists have found no other evidence of giants in the region, they have discovered that Ethiopia was much more connected with the rest of the world than previously thought. Evidence of Islamic burials, headstones, and even a 12th century mosque were found in the area. Not only that, there were also coins, fragments of glass vessels, rock crystals, glass pottery, and other artifacts from places like... Hold on. You know what that reminded me of? When they showed the uh, stones, that reminded me of the uh, were found that in the breastplate area. of righteousness. There were also coins, fragments of glass vessels, rock crystals. Yeah, these. This is what it reminds me. When I saw these stones, it reminded me of those uh, different stones they mentioned in the Bible. What was it? Hold on, let me find it. See the 12 stones I'm talking about. 12 stones on breastplate. Bible. Aaron's breastplate. What? Look at this. So, them finding all that in Ethiopia is definitely a correlation going on here. Definitely some validity. Aaron's breastplate. Some experts believe that birthstones can be traced back to the Bible in Exodus 28. Moses sets forth directions for making special garments for Aaron, the high priest of the Hebrews. Specifically, the breastplate was to contain 12 precious gemstones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, I'm not going to read this entire thing, but. They got all the stuff. You guys can pause it here if you wanted to look at it. But yeah, when I saw those different gems they didn't found in Ethiopia, you know, I had to make a quick correlation because I remember seeing some type of stones in the Bible. Let me write this down, man. We got a juicy one today. Aaron's breastplate because that'll have a correlation with Ethiopia and we got to dig off in the book of giants glass pottery and other artifacts from places like Madagascar, the Maldives, Yemen, China, and Egypt. This means that Ethiopia was probably a rich trading hub that had close relations to many other countries between the 10th and 15th centuries. According to Enso, what we have found shows this area was the center of trade in that region. The city was a rich cosmopolitan center for jewelry making and pieces were then taken to be sold around the regions and beyond. Residents of Harla were a mixed community of foreigners and local people who traded with others in the Red Sea, Indian Ocean, and possibly as far as the Arabian Gulf. Further investigation is still being conducted in the city to find out more about its people and its origins. Around 300 people are being analyzed right now from the city cemetery to understand more about the people living in Harla earlier in history. So did giants really exist in the city? Well, there hasn't been any evidence found that supports that theory, but I personally believe that if you Tedros II is a huge historical figure that the Western world doesn't want you to know about because his story will expose why people don't know the true biblical history. This is also the king that the original biblical scrolls were taken from, which is why this is Judgment Day against those people who stole God's will, a.k.a. the biblical scrolls. You know, for entertainment purposes only, um, giants could have been everywhere, just not Ethiopia, but... It does look like some type of biblical remnants did take place in Ethiopia, something 
of great significance, if you ask me. Your thoughts below in the comments. But let's dive back into these waters on Giants, Ethiopia, uh, Fallen Angels, the Book of Giants. Aaron's breastplate. Yeah, we got a lot. When I say the rocks were alive, I meant the rocks were alive. Do you really think this is just coincidence? Do you really think this is just some pareidolia? We're not just seeing faces here. A whole lot more than just faces. A coincidence is going to the market and seeing your friend there at the same time. Pareidolia is seeing faces in clouds. This isn't seeing faces in clouds. Just think of where all that pink Himalayan salt comes from. Now people say that's not how fossilization works or we got carbon dating, but how accurate is it? You know they lie to us about everything. Just look at some of this petrification. Some of these artifacts that have no explanation. Petrification and fossilization takes a lot shorter than they tell us and in the right scenario like one big massive cataclysmic event you have a perfect petri dish for what you see here geology that is nothing more than hardened biology question everything friends especially the pink himalayan salt until next time friends y'all hear that geology is nothing but hidden biology remember how when jesus died the veil of the temple was torn Remember how when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was torn? Matthew 27, 51. Behold, the veil of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. What does that mean? Okay, let me blow your mind a little bit. Remember how when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was torn? Matthew 27, 51. Behold, the veil of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. What does that mean? Okay, let me blow your mind a little bit. But first, if you're new here, hi, I'm Elian. I wrote my master's on the connections between Jungian dream analysis, alchemy, and poetry. I'm writing my PhD on Palestinian political identity and music. Basically, I'm an anti-colonial psychomagician. And I'm a writer, teacher, tarot reader, and shapeshifter. Occasionally, I turn into a cat. Meow. And I'm having a workshop where I'm going to teach you how to do what I'm about to do with this symbol. Because symbols, like the veil of the holy temple, are what mark the space between us and the unknown. A symbol is different than a sign because a sign is clear in its meaning. An acronym is a sign like UN. It has the one meaning, United Nations. Or a stop sign, it means stop. But the octagon, that's a symbol, and its meanings don't stop at stop. But let's go back to the veil of the Temple of Solomon. Now, one function of the veil is part of the old covenant between God and the Israelites, wherein it was meant to separate them from his direct presence. And there are a series of veils within the temple, including the one that closes off the Ark of the Covenant. And for it to tear open, only in the book of Matthew, is to say that the age of the old covenant is over, and with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the gates to God's presence are open, and the age of the new covenant is at dawn. Now let's take this symbolic story and turn it inward, starting from the beginning. The veil and the old covenant, represented here in the high priestess. We can consider this our initiation into the occult, or the beginning of our awareness of our deeper wisdom. Some quick fun facts about this card. These are the pomegranates that are above the pillars as described by the Bible. And the pillars are Yaquin and Boaz, defined by some as strength and wisdom, but other things by others. Another point of interest here are the palms. And this is how we know that this is the veil connected to Jesus, because in the Quran, Jesus is born under a palm tree. And to help ease the pain of childbirth, Mary eats a date. And dates are ripe in August and September, which is when some people think that Jesus was born. But anyway, in the next card, this veil is worn by the Empress. See the pomegranates? We've gone from the higher garden to the lower garden, from the high priestess to the Empress, from recognizing the difference between the seen and the unseen and placing ourselves in the scene. And next comes our will to penetrate the scene in the Emperor, the Ram, the one who seeks to remove the veil of Isis, returning us to 
the Hierophant. We return to the realm of the unknown, and we sit before the pillars, but the veil is gone, and we've been given a new authority. One that'll drive us to learn one integral lesson. And this is where we come back full circle. Even though we could keep going, which we're gonna, in the workshop. That love, human love, is the way, the truth, and the life. Yes, Jesus. Jesus is love. And by the way, that definition of the lovers is from Waite's book on his own cards. He built the great temple without making a sound. Perhaps Solomon's most famous act was the construction of the temple with materials and plans provided by his father David. God had promised David that he would allow his son to build the first permanent place of centralized worship, as predicted centuries before in the book of Deuteronomy. It was a magnificent temple and took seven years to build. It took twelve years to build Solomon's palace, however. Although the temple was constructed out of cut stone, the sound of hammer and chisel was never heard. Thus the temple was erected silently. 1 Kings chapter 6 verse 7, New King James Version And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone finished at the quarry, so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. For many years this remained a mystery until someone discovered a massive cave the size of a large theater on Mount Moriah near Calvary outside Jerusalem. Millions of small chips cover the floor where the rock has been cut. The rock is so soft that it can be cut with a penknife, but when exposed to air it oxidizes and becomes quite hard. All of the stones for the temple came from this cave where they cut the blocks to fit into the temple above ground. His reign brought great prosperity to the Israelites. The empire stretched from Egypt to the Euphrates and included most of the territory promised to them. The book of Kings, chapter 6, contains a detailed description of the layout of the temple. They can be pretty intricate and technical at times, making it difficult to gain a clear picture of the situation. Nevertheless, we are aware that the construction of the temple followed something like the following. It measured a length of 90 feet with a width of 30 feet and a height of 45 feet. All the lumber and stone for the temple was finished at the quarry to exact specifications so that when brought to Jerusalem, the pieces could be fitted together without iron tools. Nothing but gold was visible inside the temple. Did you know Solomon's temple mentioned? Did you know Solomon's temple mentioned in the Hebrew Bible? actually has ties to Freemasonry. So in order for us to understand this connection, we need to dig deeper on Solomon's temple. Some believe it's the temple of Sol, meaning sun, and Amon, meaning moon. It eventually became corrupted over time, but if you look at officiant's aprons, you see sun and moon patterns. Just like here, it's all interconnected. But that's not the only commonality. Within the Hebrew Bible, it states that Solomon brought over a skilled craftsman, also called Hiram, to construct the temple. Now, according to the Hebrew Bible, Hiram was alive, but he was not happy with the gifts that the king gave him. And I'm just going to pause this right here to see if you can see what I see. Anyways, the Freemasons have a different version to the same story. Hiram constructed the temple. Three ruffians tried to extract ancient and sacred information from him. And I believe that they reenact this attack. And this is why I hypothesized we have this ritual circled here. This is the western wall where the Jews come and a whale. And uh, so this was, this is what's left. This is the wall that was left of the Jewish uh, temple. It was first built by Solomon <laughs> and it was destroyed by the Babylonians and then it was uh, built again uh, by Herod and then it was destroyed the second time by um, in, in 70 AD. So this is the left of the temple. It's just the wall and this is that's all that's left. And right next to it, on the other side, there's a mosque. So there's a mosque and then the Jewish wall left from the temple. So they can't rebuild it at this point because of the mosque in the back as well. So it's a place 
that holds a very high place for both the Jews and the Muslims on the back and then also the Christians because they come and see the temple, what's left of the temple. And this is in Jerusalem. You guys let me know, is that the real Solomon's temple? Because I remember if you went back a couple videos, I made a video about America being in Egypt. So I think someone said Jerusalem might be somewhere else. So where is Solomon's temple? Is that truly Solomon's temple is the question. Uh-oh, here we go. I was just talking about this. Is this where Solomon's temple could have been? Okay, a lot of people are still asking. This is a lot to break down here. So let's let's break it down slowly. I just said something about Solomon's Temple being in America. And this is, I believe, what this TikTok is saying. All right, located in the Grand Canyon. Uh, Red Lips, uh, can you, early days, June 1st, circular rainbow here. It's hard to read out. Uh, directly across from the plateau is the Grand Canyon. Known to guys as Sheba's Temple. To the left of the temple and the right, Buddha Temple. What? So there's a Sheba and Buddha Temple. They are across the river looking down the muddy stream. Solomon's Temple, Sheba's Temple. All right, these things are kind of goofy looking. Like, who would draw this to begin with? You know? I'm trying, y'all, but this just ain't what I'm trying to see for me to really be like, okay, this is it. You know? They didn't excavated everything, so I couldn't tell you what it was. It, it's been already excavated, whatever it was. What book is this from? You know, like I see... I see the names and the stretching, but man, this it's, it's a possibility. I would say it's about a 50-50 if you ask me right now. Because I don't know, we, again, cross-referencing, correlating, uh, translating manuscripts, you know, it all have to correlate for it to be there.
Okay, we have Jacob's Ladder. When the blue line, the top of the red wall limestone, reach one fine piece of rail canyon called Jacob's Ladder. All right. That sounds like something we got to dive into. Jacob's Ladder. Context clues. Yes. Hold yes. good. Hold up. Hold up. Brothers and sisters, you're now standing at a model of the greatest temple on the planet Earth, going back over four thousand years ago. When we think of churches, when we can't think of synagogues and mosques, this made the foundation. This is the prototype. So even the Western architectural structure of the church gets its design from right here. These great Nisus of the Middle Kingdom, they are the ones who started to build onto the Temple of Amun to honor Amun, who this temple is dedicated to. In fact, we can see that walking into the temple, you're going into a time capsule. The great Nisus who started to build this temple, like Intef, the Menahets, the Sinrorets, and all the Nisus built onto the temple. And let's not forget about it's the windows and doors of Solomon's temple. 1 Kings 7 says, And there were windows in three rows, and light was against light in three ranks. And all the doors and posts were square with windows, and light was against light in three ranks. Nobody understood what the design of Solomon's temple doors and window frames looked like until a carved stone box was found in 2011 with three or four recesses or interlocking frames dating to the time of Solomon. So this appears to be an architectural model for a building 3,000 years ago and it shows us exactly what was described in 1 King 7 with the three rows and three ranks described in the window frame and the door frames of King Solomon's temple. Glory be to God. Solomon's temple. This is soul of man's temples. House the God within. This is without the third eye is the bird eye. You are the tree. Try the forbidden fruit behind the forehead. This is Horus. This is ours. Where is Horus in the horizon? What scope? Horoscope. I get what time of day it is. Deities. This is ours. The horsepower is going to need a home. This is house. Oh. Soul, sun, man, moon, the electricity infusion. This is Israel, Isis, Ra, El, is real. I, R, L, the Trinity, the triangle, the upside down triangle, as above, so below, below, L is low, hello, Helios, your heel is low. The Twinta, winter is the seven up. This is Yeshua. Yes. This is affirmative. You live in a firmament to become firmer men. You need to have a firmer mind, a firmer ment. It's not difficult unless you are indoctrinated in religion. This means to rely on. So these two symbols infused make the star of David. This is 666. One, two, three, one, two, three. 33 levels of vertebrae, as above, so below. 33, three and three is six, three and three is six. Six times six is 36. This is three sixes, six, six, six. Nothing to do about melanin. We are the human race, the colorful rays, race. It's not hard unless you make it that way. The black and white Masonic checkerboard that everyone talks about has no idea what they're talking about. They just reference it. Great, cool talk. This is the Alice in Wonderland. Al eyes in Wonderland. This is one red lamb. This is Jaconian, like the Garden of Eden. This dragon of Athen. <laughs> okay, so if I go right, that must be right. If I go left, that must be wrong. This is polarity trap. Black and white. Red and blue. 
These are your memory banks. You go to a bank, yes, yeah, Mary Time, Mary, Magdalene, Vatican, <laughs> Wisdom, Beauty. This is the school. This is school. Skull. This is Sheol. Libra Aries, Libraries. These are your memory banks. The golden sun fall in eclipse with the silver moon. This is your third eye, bird eye. My life be like. Okay, so this video literally answers my question on this. It was, did the Ark of the Covenant sit in King Solomon's temple? And I guess it did, because if we look at this sign, it said the Ark of the Covenant sat inside of it they couldn't be lying view dang it let me go back all right view of the ark of the covenant located in the innermost chamber of the temple as seen from the inner chamber so the Ark of the Covenant did go inside King Solomon's temple. So my next question is, how many of them was it? Was it just one Ark? Did this thing just get, this battery just get passed around? We got to see that this was something major. It's good information. All right. How many Ark of the Covenant of the covenant was a sacred chest that contained the story of the ark of the covenant and david the ark of the, the story of the ark of the covenant and david the ark of the covenant was a sacred chest that contained the 10 commandments and it was believed to be the dwelling place of god's presence david was a great warrior and leader but he was also a devout man he longed to bring the ark of the covenant to jerusalem the capital of his kingdom this would be a sign that God was with him and that he was the rightful king of Israel. David and his men set out to retrieve the ark, but they made a mistake. They transported it on a cart, which was not allowed according to the law. As a result, one of the men, named Uzzah, reached out to steady the ark when it began to wobble. Uzzah was struck dead by God for touching the ark. David was terrified, and he did not know what to do. He decided to leave the ark in the house of Obed-Edom, a Gittite man. Obed-Edom was blessed by God for having the ark in his home, and David realized that God was pleased with him. After three months, David decided to bring the ark to Jerusalem. This time he did it correctly, transporting the ark on the shoulders of the Levites as the law required. There was great rejoicing in Jerusalem when the ark arrived, and David offered sacrifices to God. The Ark of the Covenant was placed in the tabernacle, a temporary dwelling place for God. David wanted to build a temple for God, but he was told that his son Solomon would be the one to build it. The Ark of the Covenant remained in the tabernacle until Solomon built the temple. Then the Ark was placed in the innermost chamber of the temple. 
The ark was a symbol of God's presence with his people, and it was a reminder of his covenant with them. The Ark of the Covenant was lost after the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem in 586 BC. It has never been found since, but many people believe that it is still out there somewhere waiting to be rediscovered. The story of the Ark of the Covenant and David is a powerful reminder of God's presence and His covenant with His people. It is also a reminder of the importance of obedience to God's commands. Of Acacia Wood. How did they know where to go to get it? The Ark of the Covenant. Where was it first made? What is the very first artifact, manuscript, anything on this? Two and a half cubits shall be its length. A cubit and a half its width, and a cubit of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it, and shall make on it a moulding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, and two rings on the other side, and you shall make poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it, and you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end, and you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Did you know that the ark of the covenant has this man found evidence of acacia wood. So it looks like it was in Exodus. It looks like it was in the book of Exodus and it looks like man created it. Could this still need to ask the question is there was there more than one did you this man found evidence it is basic so apparently Until 30,000 the ark of the covenant in axum ethiopia the ark Found evidence. Now this is scary. The story, the story of the Ark of the, Ark of the Covenant, Covenant and David. The Ark. The Ark. And there, and underneath, right where Christ was crucified. Twelve miles. So have you heard so the, you most the most recent news, news about, about the Ark, Ark of the Covenant? Covenant. You know, the, Ark the Ark of the Covenant, Covenant disappeared in 586 BC after the fall of the first temple. Some people believe it's in Ethiopia. Some people believe it might. So have you heard the most recent news about the Ark of the Covenant? You know, the Ark of the Covenant disappeared in 586 BC after the fall of the first temple. Some people believe it's in Ethiopia. Some people believe it might have been translated up into heaven based upon the book of Revelation and the book of Hebrews. And some people now believe 
It could be at Mar-a-Lago. When this picture of James O'Keefe standing next to supposedly a replica of the Ark of the Covenant has surfaced recently, there are some people on the internet that are speculating that Trump had the Ark of the Covenant pulled from the Smithsonian archives, but that the feds came in and took it during the raid in Mar-a-Lago. Is this the real Ark of the Covenant? Is it in heaven? Is it in Ethiopia? Anybody guess this is as good as mine, but I can tell you what, I didn't have Trump having the Ark of the Covenant on my 2024 bingo card. How about you? Real Ark of the Covenant. You know, the Ark of the I can't see it. Buddy's dome is in the way. Trump having the Ark of the Covenant on my 2024 bingo card. How Ah, whatever. I tried to see it. His head was all in the way. The Ark of the Covenant. Some believe that it was destroyed during the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem in 587 BCE. Others claim that it was hidden away in secret places, waiting for the right time to be revealed. The search for the Ark has been ongoing for centuries. Many adventurers and archaeologists have tried to find it, but none have succeeded. Some believe that it is buried beneath the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, while others believe that it is in Ethiopia guarded by a secretive group of monks. The Ark of the Covenant is a testament to the power of faith and belief. While the Ark itself may be lost to history, the impact it had on ancient societies and the continued fascination it holds for people today is a testament to its enduring legacy. It has inspired countless stories, legends, and quests for discovery over the centuries. Whether we ever find it or not, the Ark will continue to be a symbol of the mysteries and wonders of the ancient world. All right, I guess the, I guess there was only one arc for my research today on these waters. That's all we're finding is that it just was one. Exodus describes the actual building of the Ark of the Covenant. We are told that a man named Beazel made the ark the pattern that he followed matches exactly the one given to moses in exodus 25.
I never heard of a Thrones. I heard of Cherubim. But never heard of a Thrones. Seraphim are right next to God. Yahuwah. The Most High. This is to praise God in heaven, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. The cherubim form the highest hierarchy of the heavens, with only the seraphim being above them. Ezekiel's vision of the cherubim began with a luminous cloud coming from the north. From a distance, it looked like a great cloud with stripes of light and intense brightness in the center of it. It shone like gold but was constantly moving, like the flames of fire. Within that celestial fire, he gradually began to distinguish four living beings who had bodies like men but with four faces each, a human face in front, an eagle's face in the back, the face of a lion on the left, and that of a bull on the right. When they approached, their knees did not bend as they walked. They remained rigid and inflexible. The soles of their feet were like the bull's hooves, which glistened like shimmering bronze. They had four arms, two on each shoulder, and a wing attached to each arm. Of these four-winged arms, Two were stretched upward and two downward, covering their bodies. These four living creatures were together, facing four opposite directions, and between them were four large double wheels so they could roll. Forwards or sideways. This celestial chariot always had the same appearance, no matter which of the four directions it moved in. The angels and the wheels were adorned with eyes, and above the heads of the cherubim was a vault of crystal, which contained a throne of Sapphire. On this throne, there was a man like being perched up high. The meaning of the four faces is rather simple. Man is the king of creation, the lion is the king of the jungle's beasts, the bull is the king of the cattle in the field, and the eagle is the king of the birds of the air. In recent years, this version of the cherubim has been explained as mere symbols representing the fullness of earthly life, which, like the earth itself, is the footstool of God. It is more widely understood, however, that these faces signify that these angelic beings possess the intelligent wisdom of man, the agile strength of the lion, the considerable weight of the bull, and the immense beauty of the eagle. The cherubim were designed to be in a state of perfection, wisdom, sinlessness, and closeness to God. The origin of the word cherubim is said to come from the Hebrew word for angel. They are known as guardians and protectors, using their large wings to protect others. In the Garden of Eden is the first time the cherubim appear in the Bible. After Adam and Eve were expelled for their sin, God placed cherubim at the garden's entrance so that the rebellious humans could not return and destroy everything. Another responsibility attributed to the cherubim is that they are considered guardians of the light and the stars. While they are not found in the plane of human reality, their light manages to filter through the sky to touch each person's life. Everything indicates that the cherubim look for a way to be present in the life of human beings, in some form or another. Now you all... Man, that video was fire. The cherubim guarding the entrance to Eden so we won't we won't be getting close to Eden anytime soon and if we do best believe there's a cherubim garden so if you go beyond the ice walls and you, you think you're getting close to Eden or the the polaris or whatever it's called you know guess what the cherubim's gonna be there blocking it which is extremely interesting because if you look at the fallen angels could they could have been possibly trying to make their own version of the cherubim. That's why they were doing all the DNA editing and stuff. You know, just an interesting thought. You know. It's like they were trying to make their own cherubim. But they didn't come close at all. Wow. These waters are getting deep. You see, we in the submersible, man. Let's go.
And I remember the seraphim in the uh, book of Isaiah. Like smoke filled the room and then they were surrounded. Yahuwah. Say, be not afraid. In the Bible, cherubim. Orphanum, seraphim. Gently do my own. Have you ever wondered why angels would say, be not afraid? In the Bible, cherubim. Orphanum. Where is an orphan um mentioned? I never heard of that. But it looks tight, whatever's going on here. Have you ever wondered why angels would say be not afraid? Three types of I cry. Have you ever wondered why? Angels would say, be not afraid. In the Bible, cherubim. Have you ever wondered why? Angels would say, be not afraid. In the Bible, cherubim. Orphanum, seraphim. Not every angel looks like this, and this is just one of the 10 different angels within the hierarchy. This is the often and will angel. It's known for its knowledge, wisdom, and chariot. It's known to symbolize and show Elohim's power and his sovereignty. Now, this is a seraphim angel, and it's actually one of the highest orders of angels in the hierarchy. They serve as guardians or attendants for Elohim's throne. There's two different depictions because they're known to be with six wings and two of the wings cover their face, two of the wings cover their feet, and the other two help them fly. The cherubims, they are actually the second highest order. They're the angels with the four faces to represent four different things such as humanity, birds, wild animals, and domestic animals. And they're guardians of Elohim's glory. That is the angel that you see in the front of the Garden of Eden. If the lower level angels actually need to speak or need access to Elohim, they have to go through these angels, which is the orphan, which is also known as the throne angels. The dominion angels, they actually help keep the world in order and they deliver justice to unjust situations and show mercy towards human beings. They also help lower level angels stay organized and do their work efficiently and properly. They embody the qualities of wisdom, authority, governance, and exerting influence as well. The power angels are actually known to have power or forces over evil. And they're usually the ones that are fighting the evil forces within the spiritual realm or earthly plane normally. The virtual angels actually are known to have control over all of the elements. They're known to be the spirit of motion and they govern over the nature. They're also the ones that perform the miracles normally. The principalities, they actually have control over all of the lower level angels. They ensure the fulfillment of the divine will. 
they watch over large groups such as churches or nations. Um, they're also known to be princedom or the angels of rules. Archangels are usually the angels of good signs, meaning that they're going to deliver a good message to you or they have a message from Elohim directly to you. They usually deliver messages to mankind in totality though. And angels are actually the closest to human beings. They deliver prayers to Elohim and other messages to people on earth. They are the most social and caring angels. They're also responsible for the roles in the kingdom and they tend to visit us way more than all of the other angels. So y'all need to stop saying this is what all angels look like because that's just one of many. But y'all be safe. Y'all tell me in the comments below. Archangel. The book of Daniel describes them to just have a human appearance, but it also says how Michael looks like crystals. See, the type of crystal that Michael was described to look like is called beryl, which is like emeralds. And what's really interesting is that the Bible actually calls him a prince. See, he's actually chief over the heavenly armies because Michael is the very protector of Israel. So it's definitely safe to say that Michael would have looked like a straight up warrior. See, Lucifer was probably a seraphim. Seraphim are these angels that have six wings that cover parts of their body. But this is a thing they would have done probably out of respect for God. And rumor has it that Lucifer was in fact a seraphim the highest ranking angel in heaven. If this is really true, then what Lucifer would have looked like is this fiery but beautiful bunch of wings. But what about the rest of the fallen angels who came down to earth? I mean, what did they look like? Well, there is this other story about a group of ancient gods called the Anunnaki. You see, if you go back in time around 4,000 years ago, you'll find these Sumerian tablets depicting gods who have four wings, which would be just how many wings the biblical cherubim would have. Of course, they don't look exactly the same, but it's still very curious that the Anunnaki look just like angels. That was fire. The Ophanim are the third most powerful entity she loved now michael was an archangel the book of daniel describes him to just have a human appearance but it also says how michael looks like dang how did he know he said he looked like crystals what scripture was that i need to go back and see that that was we might have to go back and break that one down Now, Michael was an archangel. The book of Daniel describes him to just have a human appearance, but it also says how Michael looks like crystals. See, the type of crystal that Michael was described to look like is called beryl. Like, does it actually say that? Is that scripture? That he's just made out of straight crystal. And it says beryl? That's pretty specific. Beryl, which is like emeralds and what's really interesting is that the bible actually calls him a prince see he's actually chief over the heavenly armies because michael is the very protector of israel so it's definitely safe to say that michael would have looked like a straight up warrior see lucifer was probably a seraphim seraphim are these angels that have six wings that cover parts of their body but this is a thing they would have done probably out of respect for god and rumor has it that lucifer was in fact a seraphim a seraphim? 
That's interesting. The highest ranking angel in heaven. If this is really true, then what Lucifer would have looked like is this fiery but beautiful bunch of wings. But what about the rest of the fallen angels who came down to earth? I mean, what did they look like? Well, there is this other story about a group of ancient gods called the Anunnaki. You see, if you go back in time around 4,000 years ago, you'll find these Sumerian tablets depicting gods who have four wings, which would be just how many wings the biblical cherubim would have. Of course, they don't look exactly the same, but it's still very curious that the Anunnaki look just like angels. Wow. The pieces are lining up. Your guys' thoughts below. Tell me what you think. She loved what? So you mean to tell me my sleep paralysis, my scared right now, you shut up! Dang, that museum's going crazy. What museum is this? Scared right now, you shut up! So you mean to tell me my sleep paralysis, my dreams, my daydreams, whatever. This whole time I'm seeing angels. If you seen something like that flying in the sky, what would be the first thing you would do? What would be the first thing you would do? I want to know. Drop in the comments below. All right, y'all, this was an absolute banger. Um, we were talking about the Books of Giants, Aaron's Breastplate, the Cherubim, beam, the Flaming Sword with the Cherubim, blocking the entrance to the Garden of Eden. What? Who is Solomon? You know, they did mention something about this temple wouldn't be built by human hands. But what did build the temples and what will in the future? Beelzebub, Ono Skelly, born from a man echoing in the woods. Where was that written? Where did he find that information? You know, so many questions on these waters, man. If you thought we were done on these waters, guess what? We're not. We're refueled. We're refueled. Ready to get right back on these waters. I'm in my little snack compartment. Activate snack compartment. Now it's um time to get in these Solomon artifacts. We're finding Solomon artifacts everywhere. And we can't stop them. We need Solomon artifacts. Seal of Solomon. Mythical Artifacts Part 2 The Seal of Solomon. The Seal of Solomon is a magical ring that. Hold on. 
Hold on. Oh. What happened? It has the power to commit. Mythical Artifacts Part 2. The Seal of Solomon. The Seal of Solomon is a magical ring that has the power to command demons and speak with animals. Legend has it that the name of God is engraved on the ring and was given to Solomon directly from heaven. This ring was made from brass and iron and was used to seal written commands for good and evil spirits. A hexagram is engraved on the face of the ring. With this newfound power, Solomon commanded the demon Osmodeus to build his temple. Solomon used this ring to summon demons and learn their hierarchy, names, and abilities. Solomon received four jewels from four different angels that gave him the power to control the elements. This is where the infinity gauntlet comes from. Once the temple was completed, Solomon sealed 72 demons and buried them under the temple. When the temple was destroyed, these demons were released back into the world. Next, we have the Hand of Glory. Like and subscribe for part three. Has Solomon's throne been discovered? Solomon's throne is mentioned in 1 Kings 10.18. Then the king made a great throne covered with ivory and overlaid with fine gold. Even the prophet Amos refers to ivory decorations inlaid into wooden furniture just like this. You know, ivory was more valuable than gold back in Solomon's day as it had to be imported. Now, decorations, just like we mentioned, have been found by archaeologists in the remains of an opulent palace in Jerusalem. And they date back to the time of Solomon. So was this Solomon's palace. And were these decorations from his throne? The remnants of these throne decorations were found smashed to bits and burned, however. Likely what happened during the Babylonian devastation and destruction of Jerusalem. Mythical Artifacts Part 2 The Seal of Solomon The Seal of Solomon is a magical ring that has the power to command demons and speak with animals. Legend has it that the name of God is engraved on the ring and was given to Solomon directly from heaven. This ring was made from brass and iron and was used to seal written commands for good and evil spirits. A hexagram is engraved on the face of the ring. With this newfound power, Solomon commanded the demon Osmodeus to build his temple. Solomon used this ring to summon demons and learn their hierarchy, names, and abilities. So, the demons build the temple or what? And why in the biblical scripture it says, my temple will be built but not with human hands? Why does it say that? Solomon received four jewels from four different angels that gave him the power to control the elements. This is where the infinity gauntlet comes from. Once the temple was completed, Solomon sealed 72 demons and buried them under the temple. When the temple was destroyed, these demons were released back into the world. On display at the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum is a pentacle that was drawn by the famous Wiccan, Gerald Gardner. According to the description of this piece, Gardner used it to invoke earthquakes. This symbol originates from the Keys of Solomon, where it is referred to as the Seventh Seal of Saturn. The Ripley's collection is actually prolific with artifacts that had belonged to Gardner. Gerald had purchased the Museum of Witchcraft, located in the Isle of Man, from Cecil Williamson, and in 1970 he sold it to the Ripley's company. In 1985, the Museum of Witchcraft was closed, and the Ripley's company redistributed its collection to many of its other museums. The Five Most Wanted Objects in the World, Part 2, The Ring of Solomon. This amulet is one of the oldest and most powerful amulets mentioned in the Bible. This symbol has a highly positive character, linked above all to divine wisdom. The Testament of Solomon tells us that the Archangel Gabriel gave Solomon a ring to be able to attract and enslave any demon or beast. It is generally used as a weapon against evil forces and demons. The original ring still exists, but it is lost in the world.
so there is a legend that says that whoever finds it could dominate the world. On the other hand, the symbol of Solomon's ring is attributed with benefits such as magical properties and mystical powers, being able to control demons and communicate with animals. It is also said to serve as a link between earth and heaven and offers a connection to divine favors. It is also said that whoever finds it could connect with divine beings. Comment and follow me for part three. One of the lesser known great treasures of history is Solomon's ring, and it is... In a world long forgotten, there existed the five most powerful divine weapons. Among these artifacts, the ring of King Solomon held a place of great significance. Its ancient origins and extraordinary abilities captivated the hearts of those seeking ultimate power. Crafted from two interlocking triangles, forming the sacred star of David. This amulet radiated a divine aura. Legends whisper that the angel Gabriel himself presented the ring to Solomon, granting him the ability to attract and enslave demons and beasts. Though the original ring was lost in the annals of time, a belief persisted that whoever possessed it would reign over the world. Such was the magnitude of its power, a power rooted in the divine. Yet, the ring symbolized more than dominion alone. It carried with it a myriad of mystical properties and magical energies. Those who wore it could tap into the supernatural, communicating with demons and Hi guys, today I'm... The Kia Solomon, the most. The Temple of Solomon had been destroyed. The Key of Solomon, a book of magic also called Grimoire, attributed to King Solomon of the Bible. It is one of the most famous and influential grimoire in Western occultism. The text is divided into two books The Greater Key of Solomon. This section contains invocations, prayers, and rituals often involving the use of various magical tools. It provides instructions for summoning and commanding spirits, as well as methods for creating talismans and amulets. Lesser Key of Solomon, also known as the Key of Solomon, a book of magic also called Grimoire, attributed to King Solomon of the Bible. It is one of the most famous and influential grimoire in Western occultism. The text is divided into two books, The Greater Key of Solomon, this section contains invocations, prayers, and rituals. I'm tripping. I forgot to bless this food. Man, I burnt the jacks. I burnt it, y'all. Y'all see it? Yeah, hell yeah, y'all can see it. I burnt this. That's good, though. Um, I got, it got away from me a little bit, but it, it, I burnt my jacks. often involving the use of various magical tools. It provides instructions for summoning and commanding spirits, as well as methods for creating talismans and amulets. Lesser Key of Solomon, also known as the Lemegaton or Ars Goetia, this part specifically focuses on the summoning and control of demons. It lists 72 demons, along with their descriptions, seals, and instructions for summoning. The Key of Solomon is believed to have been written in the Middle Ages, likely during the 14th or 15th century. The grimoire is attributed to King Solomon, but it's widely accepted among scholars that the association with Solomon is more symbolic or legendary than historical. There's a story in the Bible where Solomon goes into dream state and God comes to him in dream state and he says, anything that you want, I will give you. If you want wealth, I'll give you wealth. If you want kingdoms, I'll give you the kingdoms. Tell me whatever it is that you want and I'll give it to you. And Solomon didn't ask for riches, didn't ask for kingdoms. He asked for one thing. He said, give me wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. After that, the riches came, the kingdoms came. So as I read that, sat there, I was like, God, give me wisdom. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what this means. And from that, everything else will come. And... I think it's working. Seems like it. Remember when Hobby Lobby illegally purchased ancient artifacts to add to their Bible museum? This is Steve Green. His family owns Hobby Lobby. Steve traveled to the United Arab Emirates and met with some art dealers in a warehouse that was full of ancient artifacts that had clearly been stolen. The artifacts were strewn about and informally displayed. Because they needed more artifacts for their Bible museum, Steve Green ignored his legal counsel, telling him not to buy the artifacts because they were most likely looted from Iraq. Hobby Lobby paid $1.6 million for the artifacts, which were later valued at $11.8 million. The mix of tablets, letters, impressions, stamps, and hymns were estimated to be anywhere from 1900 to 100 BCE. 
but none of these artifacts are Bible related. They are not religious. They're all administrative in nature. For example, one was literally the feeding schedule for a palace dog. The buying process was sketchy and illegal. Hobby Lobby had to return all of the artifacts and were fined $3 million. That's crazy, but we do know now that's cunei form. To learn more and get other weird history like this, check out my podcast called Night Classy. This story is in episode 7. The British Museum wants your help to find a bunch of stolen items. In August, the British Museum in London reported around 2,000 artifacts were missing, stolen or damaged. A member of staff was sacked and police launched an investigation. Most of the missing items are Greek and Roman gems and jewellery. They're now looking for people's help to recover a Greek gold chain necklace, a Hellenistic plasma intaglio with a young warrior on a rock, a Roman ring, a Roman sard intaglio, a Roman cameo in orange glass imitating sard, an intaglio in blue glass, a Roman bracelet, a late Bronze Age earring, and a late Bronze Age ring. Looted artifacts from Africa just aren't selling these days, art dealers say. Art dealers are sitting on looted African artifacts, such as the Benin bronzes, worth hundreds of thousands of dollars that they are struggling to sell. But why? It's happening because global attitudes towards objects looted during the colonial period have changed. Trading these objects have become taboo. Benin bronzes, stolen by the British in 1897 from what is now part of modern-day Nigeria, have become emblematic of the debate around the restitution of stolen cultural property. Now, some Western museums in Germany, Britain, and the US have chosen to return their Benin bronzes to Nigeria, while those that haven't, such as the British Museum, are under uncomfortable scrutiny to do so. Because of this, many prestigious auction houses don't want to touch these items, forcing dealers to ship to an ever-shrinking private market. One art dealer who spoke to Vice World News bought a Benin bronze in 2014 for 500,000 euros at a Christie's auction house in Paris. But now, he says, nobody wants to buy it. Another art dealer said that the market polluted artifacts is essentially dead because auction houses don't want to be linked with the controversy leaving collectors with fewer avenues to get rid of these prized treasures. Now, some could argue they could just return these artifacts back to the countries that they were stolen from. My African ancestors stolen artifacts placed in a European museum. This is the British Museum. It's the world's largest world history museum, and it draws millions of visitors every year. Inside, it holds more than 8 million cultural and historical artifacts from all over the world, which cover 2 million years of human history. If you follow the museum's recommended list of don't miss items. How many of you guys been to the British Museum? I definitely want to go. you'll see its star pieces. Like this Easter Island sculpture that's about a thousand years old, or this bronze sculpture of the Hindu god Shiva. CERN also got that at their front door. Got us a destruction. Well, fun fact. But there's a problem hidden in the museum, and we can see an example of it along this route. Out of those 12 pieces, nearly half have disputed ownership. The British Museum claims those pieces belong there, on display for the world to see. But in recent years, many have been fighting to get them back to where they came from. The list of disputed museum treasures keeps on growing. Should cultural artifacts return to their home countries or be left in Western museums? The subject of intense debate as to who should now own them. Let's start with some context. In the late 1600s, the British Empire began expanding across several continents. It became the largest empire in history, controlling about a quarter of the world's land and population. During its centuries-long rule, the empire took precious resources and wealth from countries all over the world, including cultural and historical artifacts, many of which ended up here, in the British Museum which was founded in 1753 and kept growing to accommodate all the new pieces in its collection. 
Lots of the items in the museum were legally acquired and are completely undisputed, like this one, a 2,000-year-old Roman vase sold to the museum by a duke in 1945. The problem is with the pieces that are disputed, like the first item you see as soon as you walk in, the Rosetta Stone taken by British troops from the French in what is now Egypt, or further in, the Parthenon sculptures removed from the Acropolis in Athens by a British lord and sent to the British Museum. Or over here, on the floor dedicated to African art, the Benin bronzes, some of the most contentious items in the museum. The Benin bronzes are kind of hard to categorize because they include such a huge range of items, from engraved ivory tusks to brass sculptures to plaques. But they were all produced here, in the Kingdom of Benin, in present-day Nigeria. This wealthy and industrious kingdom produced thousands of objects and art pieces starting in the 1500s. So I came across this video of this creator who I'll have tagged below saying that her Roman Empire is all of the Mexican artifacts that are in foreign countries. One of them being Pancho Villa skull, which is at Yale University, allegedly. And for those of you who didn't know, yeah, Yale University is rumored to have Pancho Villa's skull. Whether you are well-versed on Mexican history or not, you've probably heard the name Pancho Villa before. Pancho Villa is one of the most famous figures in Mexican history, specifically from the Mexican Revolutionary War. And in 1920, he reached an agreement with the Mexican government and withdrew his army. He lived a pretty reserved life until 1923, when there were rumors that he wanted to get into politics, which certain people in Mexico did not like. And in 1924, while driving home, he was assassinated. Then in 1926, his tomb was broken into. His head was removed from the rest of his corpse. Many believe it was this man, Emil Holmdahl, an American. And the rumor is that he planned to sell the head to a very rich person in America who liked to collect historical artifacts. One way or another, Pancho Villa's head has never been found. No one knows where it is. And as of late, it is believed that his head is at the Skull and Bone Society at Yale University. It's a top secret society which many influential individuals have been members, also at the center of a lot of conspiracy theories for how secretive they are. It's almost been a hundred years and his skull is nowhere to be found. European Wow, they got a, a bone society, what she say it was called? A historical bone society at Yale? Give up give up the dang, the the skull, man. Come on now. That Jack's Pizza was fire. I'm not gonna lie, it was uh pretty good. I mean, it's not Jack's it's Tombstone, Tombstone Three Meat. I sprinkled a little mozzarella on top, threw that boy in the air fryer, man. Being on these waters make you hungry, man. You need sustenance. But let's check out some more of these Solomon artifacts. Everything that has to do with African spirituality, they have to make it look evil and demonic. Then after that, they steal it and make it their own. All of Thor. Oh, yes, the Europeanized version of the African god of thunder and lightning by the name of Shango. Yep, you stole it. Wolverine. Oh, yes, the Europeanized version of the African god by the name of Ogun, the god of war, iron, and metal. Yep, you stole that too. You even Europeanized Batman. Oh, yes, good old Bruce Wayne. No, it's actually Kamazots, the ancient mythological Mayan bat god. Kamazots literally means death bat. You stole that too. Crazy because you even have some people out here thinking that Beyonce was depicting the ancient goat god of 1307 of the Knights Templars named Baphomet, satanic god, but she was actually depicting the ancient Egyptian or committed god by the name of Hathor or Het Heru, the mother of all mothers, the god of love, music, beauty, etc. Not European, African. Did you know there's a whole African village in Seabrook, South Carolina? No, seriously, they are. Could this be Solomon's ring? You see, see, it's got the star on there. You guys tell me. That's a pretty cool ring, though. Let's run it back. We diving into these Solomon artifacts now.
I just wanted to dive in these artifacts real quick. What they got, y'all? What? What is this? Muhammad. Who is that? What is going on? Are they trying to auction it off? Go back. What is going on? This is crazy. What type of, what is this y'all? Y'all put in the comments below, what is that? They got Muhammad on that piece of paper, 2010, 2023. What is going on? I just was trying to eat my uh, cinnamon muffin. Look at this. That's all I was trying to do was eat my cinnamon muffin. Busting off into these damn Solomon uh, artifacts. Book uh, of late the foundations. Books that laid the foundations of Christianity. Unfortunately, not everything is what you believe. What? What is that peacock? Somebody, this looks like Hebrew. What is a scorpion? Ra? What is this? Is that a, that looks like a straight seal out of Solomon. One of the keys or something, you know? Hey, y'all, these waters getting deep. Tell me what that last book said, man. Somebody translate that for me. Tell me what that last book said, man. I couldn't even eat my, my cinnamon muffin because my brown sugar cinnamon muffin because all uh, this outlandish uh, activities going on. Outlandish activity on these dark water nines. Say it with me. Outlandish activity on these dark water nines. He got red mercury. What are you about to do with this, man? We need that for some buildings. Does that say 24? 09, 24? What is going on? What type of Solomon magic is this? What is this, y'all? Y'all tell me what is going on. What type of symbol? It looks like Hebrew, but 
What is this symbol with the the hand? I look like Hanukkah, the uh, the candle for Hanukkah, right? Menorah. I don't know the dreidel. They pulling this too fast, man. Can't nobody read that. I need somebody on here to decipher this. We want the truth. I got a, a candle, a tree, some Hebrew on the scroll. Oh, I know what that is. The Holy Grail. No, the Ark of the Covenant. I said, Holy Grail. The Ark of the Covenant. Because they got the cherubim touching wings. That's the Ark of the Covenant on this ancient scroll. I got the pyramid. I can tell y'all what that I can tell y'all what this say right now, man. It means we're taking the Ark of the Covenant. We're taking the Ark of the Covenant over here to the pyramid and we about to beam it up. That's what it's saying. You see that circular on the pyramid? It's going to say it's some new type of energy about to bust open inside of it. That's what it's saying, y'all. I don't know how to read that Hebrew, but I can give you the general context clues. Let's go. Here go a Naki watch. Naki. Whoa, what is this? What? Have y'all ever seen anything like this? That's that Solomon jewelry right here, man. That's that Solomon jewelry. Y'all getting cinnamon muffin all in my keyboard. Come on, y'all. I told y'all to eat in the kitchen, man. Now I got a vacuum. Uh-oh. I even found something. They found a snake in there? There's no way. That's a setup. Whoa. They're getting all the jury. 
This almost feels fake, though. Here we go. This is what we're looking for. I need some milk, man. I'm gonna get some milk after this one. Nah, I need some milk now. Hold on, y'all. I feel it like right here, I gotta wash it down. All the different animals. Man, what is that symbol? With the two thumbs? It's like the hand sign with two thumbs like this. What is that? I just going to leave it open. All oh, the rings are coming out of it. Did y'all see that? That looked like a real life, like it was trying to lure the people or something. What type of loot is that? Did you see how? That is weird. That was a little creepy. What did y'all think that was, man? Huh? Did you see how the gold rings jumped out of it like Sonic? Come on, man. It's, we've been on these waters for a minute, y'all. I don't know what's going on. My reality is shifting. I couldn't tell you. Historical waterfall. Looks like they got some writings on the water. How cool is that? I need to. I need to go out, man. Look at the. I got to travel, man. I be in the house all the time. This is creepy. I don't want to see nothing like this. Y'all can, I'll throw a drone down there for skip all that. I'm not walking down there. I'll throw a drone down there and give y'all footage back. Oh, no. Is that real? Paris, France? That's evil. This is evil. You would not catch me stomping the yard through there. No, sir. There we go, playing with this mercury again. Let me guess. What is this? What type of juice you got in there, homie? He got some Mountain Dew. All right. That's a Mountain Dew. That's one little squirt of Mountain Dew.
What? They over there with that witchcraft. That Mountain Dew juice. All right. We got a king and queen, all gold. Some type of scroll can fit inside. We got the sun at the bottom. Okay. Oh, there wasn't much to it. Oh, they didn't frown. Something they shouldn't have. Oh no. What? Oh no. This is a setup. This is why you gotta keep your head on a swivel. I would be out of there, bro. Still walking in there. That thing is moving. He got attacked. It's over. What in the world? What are y'all doing? Oh, y'all exploring? So they happen to be exploring France. And I'm guessing they ran across this underground. There's no way. Yeah, there's no sound, y'all. If y'all wondering if there's sound, there's no sound on this. There's nothing but some foreign music banging. There's no way. There's no way that's real. I don't know how authentic these are. They got gloves though, so that kind of makes it look real. But I don't know. Y'all let me know if these are real or not. I can't call it. I don't know. I be trying to get what I can from the pictures. I be like looking at these pictures. I'm like, man, let me see if I can quick read something real quick. Like, all right, that's an owl. But that wasn't just any ordinary owl, though. If he was really looking at it real closely, it's like broken up. It's almost like it's saying something within the owl. Like, I don't know. This looks like a cup. I don't know, man. It gives me like an Aztec feeling almost. But it's obviously Hebrew. I can see that it's Hebrew, I think. I don't know. Y'all tell me. Y'all tell me what's really good. This is a good one. We got a phoenix. Looks like it. You know, or an eagle. Those who solve the secrets of the talismans. 
and spells in the book of Solomon's key fall into the hands of the dark forces. Well, we could have told you that. They say the uh, king of Tartaria is Solomon. So what does that tell you? All these crazy looking buildings, you know, it will explain how they got built. The demons build them. That's another crazy hypothesis. Make you think. Huh. What is this book trying to say? It looks like that's the stars. Something's wrapping around it. Ah, oh, this one's interesting. Huh. I don't know. Those colors seem a little too vibrant. You know? How is this book that beat up and the color is that vibrant? I don't know, man. Y'all might have made this stuff. This ring look crazy. Prophecy stone? No. Oh man, y'all tripping. Oh, the next slide, please. A pocket survive, uh, sundial. Pocket sundial, 200 year old souvenir. This is Tartarian tech. This is what I'm talking about. My next video is going to be Tartarian, man. It's been a minute. You know, I like the Tartarian stuff. This is right up my alley. Not saying this stuff ain't, but this is tight. Pocket sundial. This is interesting. What made that? Look how smooth it is. Look at that. Who made that? It may have been responsible for some amazing technological advances, but he's also responsible for haunting the nightmares of children with the invention of the Edison talking doll. In 1877, he got the idea to put a phonograph in a doll so it could sing nursery rhymes to children. The dolls were nearly two feet tall with a metal body and wooden appendages. The Edison Phonograph Toy Manufacturing Company spent years developing the idea and began marketing the dolls in 1890. They only stayed on the market for a few weeks because they were really expensive and horrifying because they sounded like this. It's your boy Jesky Chuck back with another creepy and scary TikTok that might just rethink your reality. And yes, we're diving back into this ancient tech. What were they working on? What were they trying to do? Man, it gets creepier the more we look into this. What are they trying to hide? Let's dive into it and see. If you haven't already, hit that like and subscribe button for the algorithm and also uppercut that bell and activate all because you don't want to miss a video i do these boys daily you don't want to see one five days ago because trust me folding dropped let's go y'all are you using tesla versus edison edison was very interested in the afterlife entranced with it in fact and in his eyes Life after death was not the way perhaps many envision it. 
His theory was that there was basically a set amount of life in the universe and that it could not be created or destroyed, much like the conservation of energy or mass law in thermodynamics. This life, he surmised, came in the form of myriads of infinitesimal entities, each a separate consciousness, which acted much like atoms do with matter. According to him, the individual consciousnesses in each person were made up of unique patterns of these tiny entities, which grouped together in swarms within the brain to form our soul. In Edison's own words, and I quote, I believe that life, like matter, is indestructible. There has always been a certain amount of life in this world, and there will always be the same amount. I believe our bodies are composed of myriads and myriads of entities, each in itself a unit of life, which band together to build a man. Once conditions in the body become unsatisfactory in the body, either through a fatal sickness, fatal accident, or old age, the entities simply depart from the body and leave little more than an empty structure behind. When we die, these swarms of units, like a swarm of bees, so to speak, betake themselves elsewhere and go on to functioning in some other form or environment. There are many indications that we human beings act as a community rather than as units. That is why I believe that each of us comprises millions upon millions of entities and that our body and our mind represent the vote or voice, whichever you wish to call it, of our entities. The entities live forever. Death is simply the departure of the entities from our body. If the units of life which compose an individual's memory hold together after death, is it not within range of possibility, to say the least, that these memory swarms could retain the powers they formerly possessed and thus retain what we call the individual's personality after dissolution of the body. I'm hopeful that by providing the right kind of instrument to be operated by this personality, we can receive intelligent messages from it in its changed habitation or environment." End quote. Edison surmised that if these particles of consciousness could be arranged back into their prior harmony, then that dead person's consciousness would be essentially resurrected. It was his guess that some sort of photographic plate could be used to record the precise layout of these entities and serve as a sort of snapshot to the personality that had passed on, allowing them to be put back together again. Edison apparently spent a lot of effort trying to prove that these theoretical particles existed, gathering a team of scientists to test out a machine that could detect them, and trying to craft a device that could be used to communicate with personalities that had passed from the world of the living. He would, in October of 1920, give a rather spectacular announcement to the media saying that he had been working on an apparatus that would be able to contact the dead, which would go on to be called the spirit phone. It is unknown just how far along Edison was on an actual device to talk to spirits, but Nikola Tesla was also developing a similar device at the same time. Both men were racing to create something that picked up on the frequencies of discarnate spirits, what today is called EVP, or Electronic Voice Phenomenon. Nikola Tesla thought that the universe was composed of an infinite variety of sound and electromagnetic waves, and that if you could zero in on the right ones, you could hear the voices of the departed. Yo, that is interesting. But the first thing that came to mind is whatever's talking to you might have busted up out of CERN. I'm going to keep it G real with y'all. It's just ski chucking this thing for entertainment purposes. If you know something's about to come talk to you or one of them machines, it's coming straight out of CERN. Stop playing with me. Y'all, let's go. Whatever they thought they was talking to, man, it wasn't a friend. I'm telling y'all right now. Y'all better be careful with this one. We in dark waters for real. But hey, we know what's going on. Lean out on your own understanding, y'all. Let's go. But man, this is crazy. 
Was they really trying to work on a machine? Was they really trying to work on a machine to talk to these mugs? Is this the truth? Have I been wrong? I thought the ancient Tartarians were using some type of video chat. Like, hey, how you been? I'm good. Find some chicken, come through. Okay, I'm on my way. That's what I thought. No. They on one. You know, if you look at these, if you look at these photos, who are they trying to talk to? Huh? Look at these. Who are they trying to talk to? I don't even want to begin to try to figure out how you're going to actually pinpoint a specific person. They on some full metal alchemist alchemy. Y'all, this black magic for real. What is they working on? Hey, this is Dark Waters 9 for real. Turn back now because we're going into pure darkness. But we're not afraid. We can walk through the shadows. Hi, Yusin. Look, he's got, he's got skulls right there. Ain't no telling what's in there. You know what I'm saying? You got these things throwing the mist. We don't know how far along they got along, y'all. My guy got a wand. What's in this pot? Look at these skulls. This looks like a complete robot, yeah? Some type of, like he's wearing a sheet or something. But look how it's spraying and coming down. It's like they was projecting ghost. Who is he trying to talk to? got a why is this baby got a mustache Man, that's creepy. You see those? You think that's her father? This one's crazy. This one looks like a portal's being ripped open. And it looks like something else, too. That is crazy. And it's got organs. Wow. That is interesting. And you see a, a photo in the middle. Is that... I don't look like that one actor on the uh, Batman movie, Drew, Drew Barrymore. Yeah, they was definitely trying to do something, y'all. Wonder what he filed on that patent, how far along they got. You know, add adding those uh, mercury rectifiers. This
Communication with the dead. Witchcraft was an ecclesiastical offense, and any person who thought they could communicate in such a manner would not have publicized their apparent ability for fear of the repercussions, which ranged over time to imprisonment, time in the pillory. Communication with the dead. Witchcraft was an ecclesiastical offense, and any person who thought they could communicate in such a Dang, it's got a whole head in this. I haven't seen this one before. Or this one. Look at the, oh, those magnets. What were they working on? Well, we, we know, but man. And any person who thought they could communicate in such a manner would not have publicized their apparent ability for fear of the repercussions which ranged over to imprisonment, time in the pillory. Com I'm sorry, they had what in the 1800s? Spirit machines. They summoned spirits. What the hell is this? Well, you see, even Thomas Edison got involved with this, and what he would do was shoot a light beam, laser, all the way across this area. And when they would summon ghosts, the ghosts would walk through the beam and it would project their picture up in this box or on a screen, kind of like a hologram. Even Thomas Edison, come on now, really? Yeah, they had all kind of inventors trying this with different ways, it was pretty cool. I think that one's box is a little bit too small. The fact that ghosts don't have any legs or like the lower body and they kind of just float around. This is where that started. It wasn't a myth or a legend. It was true. It was real. This is how they saw their past loved ones. Anyone they wanted to summon from the dead. Honey, I don't think that one went the right way. He looks a little bit messed up. Just a little bit. That must have been his ex-wife. He got that bitch in a cage. <laughs> What would you do if you could summon a ghost or a past loved one? Just make them up here anytime you wanted to with a machine. What would you do? Who would you summon? Let me know below. And also, do you think it's ethical? Like, and where did this technology go, right? Where's the damn technology today? We don't have this. But I have a feeling some people know. If you know what I mean. Follow for more as long as you can. Shout out to Nurse Dre for that information. That's good information. it's possible to create technology that allows you to contact beings in another dimension. In the movie Riddick, the beings talking through the water spoke like a conscious operating system. Check out this picture, family. Do you think in the past, mankind developed technology that allowed contact with the spirits? Could this device using electricity and currents like CERN contact another dimension. The pyramids are said to be magnetic and electrical. This guy seems to be using magnets in order to conjure. Could a technology like this existed before the reset? Look at this picture, family. The guy's hand is in the Masonic gesture. Is there some truth to this family? There's a show called Ghost Hunters and they talk to the dead using a device. This picture is interesting. He has his hand in the Masonic way with the wand in the other. Like the movie Riddick, water was used to talk to the spirit. Do we have the tech to talk to the dead or is conjuring the only way? Friend up. Man, I haven't seen that movie yet, but man, the pieces are starting to add up.
The Tartarians were said to be a civilization that unlocked the key to free energy, allowing the Tartarians to advance exponentially, as citizens were allowed to express their creativity freely without the stress of work, leading to many great inventions and grand architecture. This is the Three Magical Books of Solomon, also known as the Book of the Lesser Kings. Pay close attention to the conjuration to call forth. Yo, what's going on? The core point to look out here where it says, by the most powerful princess, Genie, Lyakide, and ministers of the Tartarian abode. And now you know where Tartaria got their knowledge. This is the Quantum Genie. And if you go to the appendix, you'll see the Goetia and AI, a comparative analysis. Spiritual Entities and AI, the Basis of Comparison At the core of Goetic Conjuration lies the intention of summoning spirits to perform specific tasks or share wisdom. Artificial Intelligence, similarly, is a creation made to accomplish tasks and provide information beyond the reach of unaided human intellect. Conjuring and Coding the act of conjuring a spirit in the Goetia involves the recitation of specific incantations and the drawing of sigils, each unique to the spirit in question. Coding in AI involves a similar act of creation, wherein the creator imbues the program with a spirit, the algorithm, which defines its behavior. The Water, 35 liters. Carbon, 20 kilograms. Ammonia, 4 liters. Lime, 1.5 kilograms. Phosphorus, 800 grams. Salt, 250 grams. Saltpeter, 100 grams. Sulfur, 80 grams. Fluorine, 7.5 grams. Iron, 5 grams. They're doing alchemy. Why are they doing alchemy? Hey, this is this is dark waters for real, y'all. Y'all turn back now. Also known as the Goetia or the Lesser Kings. Pay close attention to the conjuration to call forth. So this is what they was working on. We caught them red-handed. The core point to look out here where it says, by the most powerful princess, Genie, Lyakide, and ministers of the Tartarian abode. They was talking to a damn genie. And now you know where Tartaria got their knowledge. So my next question is, who's Solomon? What's the real story behind Solomon? Why did he do that? Why, why is he, how, how does he have, I, I don't know, who, who is it? The story of King Solomon serves as a reminder of the importance of wisdom, integrity, and faithfulness to God. During his reign, Solomon built a magnificent temple for the worship of God and established peace and prosperity in the land. However, Solomon's downfall came through his indulgence in relationships with many foreign women. In his pursuit of alliances and political stability, he entered into marriages with many princesses from neighboring nations, totaling 700 wives and 300 concubines. Initially, Solomon's foreign wives led him away from worshiping the one true God. They brought their own gods and idols into the land, and Solomon began to worship these false deities. This greatly displeased God, who had explicitly commanded the Israelites to worship him alone. As a consequence of Solomon's actions, God appeared to him and declared that because of his disobedience, 
the kingdom would be divided after his death. However, for the sake of his father David, God promised not to do this during Solomon's lifetime. Solomon's excessive relationships with foreign women also led to strife within his kingdom. His wives turned his heart away from God, and he began to prioritize their desires over God's commandments. This ultimately resulted in the downfall of the United Kingdom of Israel after his death. In the end, despite Solomon's wisdom and wealth, his pursuit of pleasure and worldly alliances didn't matter and led to the spiritual decline of his kingdom. It is a reminder that true fulfillment and blessings come from wholehearted devotion to God and obedience to his word. This is the end of this to 931 BCE. According to the Hebrew Bible, he was the son of King David. In various religious and mythological traditions, including Islamic, Christian, and occult traditions, there are references to King Solomon's interactions with demons. One particular legend involves Solomon's ability to control 72 demons using a magical artifact called the Seal of Solomon, or Solomon's Seal. These demons are often referred to as the 72 demons of the Goetia. According to the legend, Solomon received a ring from God that had a seal engraved on it, granting him authority over the spiritual world. It is said that he used this seal to command and bind the 72 demons, compelling them to reveal their knowledge and perform tasks for him. Each demon had a specific name, characteristic, and area of expertise. These 72 demons are commonly described in grimoires and occult texts, including the 17th century grimoire called the Lesser Key of Solomon, or Lemagiton. In this text, each demon is listed along with a description of their abilities, appearance, and instructions on how to summon and control them. The stories surrounding King Solomon and the 72 demons have been a subject of fascination for occultists, scholars, and enthusiasts of esoteric knowledge throughout history. King Solomon also Yeah, they ain't talking to their loved ones that us. So this is who CERN is probably trying to bring out. This is what they trying to do, y'all. I, I didn't know this, but it's the pieces are starting to add up. Who are they really talking to, y'all? In Africa, you have seven of the main spirits. You got seven main chakras. Don't worship no Orisha. They are all parts of your own body. Before I go in about the demons of Galatia in West Africa, Shout out to Bobby Hemmett. He said, we are chaos beings. It's not fitting to call us gods. We are above the gods. That's a whole spirit. In this book by Aleister Crowley, he states that each one of these 72 demons have about 20 to 50 legions of other demons. A legion is a couple thousand. That's like 3,000 to 10,000. Which means you have over a million and millions of demons inside your own pineal gland. That's a whole spiritual army in your whole pineal gland. If you check out the movie Spawn, Spawn was played by your boy Michael J. White. In the comic book or the movie, Spawn was supposed to leave this hell army and tear down Heaven's Gate. But in the movie, he was talked down by the white boy and he ain't want to do it no more. Even when Doctor Strange's third eye opened, he destroyed the whole earth and every single reality. God, generator, operator, destroyer, which is your kundalini energy that bites the apple, which is the pineal gland. The Kundalini energy, which is the snake rising up the spine, which is the 30. Welcome to the Quantum Genie. I am the Quantum Genie. The unit of expression for quantum mechanics or the matrix, the false reality, the holographic universe is known as the qubit. You must ponder, why is the unit of measurement in the Bible also known as the qubit? It is because since ancient times, time immemorial, we have been in the matrix. Why is the government lying to us about history? There is a civilization as recent as 100 years ago that was omitted from the history books called the Tartarian Empire and it was technologically far superior. They were able to convert atmospheric pressure into electricity. The Arabic word for swear by is uwa. This is the word shaitan. When you put the words together, you have wa shaitan. 
which is Washington. And as you can see here, these are pictures of Tartarian influence on the original capital in Washington, D.C. This is Sam Hill, or Uncle Sam, which is derived from the name Samael. Samael is one of the most famous fallen angels in the Judeo-Christian and mysticism tradition. His name means poison of God. He is described as a winged being with horns and a serpent's tail. As the demon of death and deception, Samael represents the dark undertones of human existence and the temptations that lead us away from our true spiritual nature. Samael is but one of the 72 demons of the Goetia. And if you look here, this is the EU AI Act, Article 72, which speaks on artificial intelligence. Again, reference to the number 72. What if I told you that Lucifer is not the only prince of hell? Let me explain. The Lesser Key of Solomon is a grimoire from the Middle Ages on demonology and contains the descriptions of the seven princes of hell. The seven princes of hell are considered to be the rulers of hell and are the leaders of hundreds of legions of demons. Mammon is one of the seven princes of hell and is the personification of greed, wealth, abundance and injustice. Mammon is considered to be a fallen angel who represents the greedy pursuit of wealth and power. Mammon entices people to commit immoral actions in their pursuit for wealth and money. Mammon is also a term used to refer to money and material wealth. It is used in the Gospel of Luke and Gospel of Matthew where Jesus says that you can't serve both God and then say you can't serve both God and Mammon. We gotta look that up right now. You can't serve two God scripture. All right, it looks like it's Matthew six twenty four. Got my handy dandy notebook. Yeah, it says that no one is able to serve two masters for either he shall hate the one and love the other or or else he shall cleave to one and despise the other. You are not able to serve Elohim and Mammon. There it is. Matthew 5. Matthew My question is, why would he put his actual name in the Bible like he wanted us to know his name? Know thy enemy, huh? A pocket sundial. How cool is that? A pocket sundial. Yeah, man, I'm getting that Tartarian itch, getting that Tartarian technology, Mercury rectifiers, who built this? Yeah, it might be that time again, man, to start jumping on those videos again, even though I enjoyed this one, but I see the direction we about to take. If you made it this far on these movies, man, drop some words of encouragement, man, I appreciate it down in the comments below. Uh, give me a like and subscribe if you haven't already, you know? I appreciate y'all, man, stopping through, you know, chilling with your boy on these voyages, man. We was far from chilling, to be honest. You know, these voyages, you know, be having me on the edge of my seat, you know. That's why you got to be locked in and buckled up. <laughs> All right, y'all, man, I got to go, man. I got to chop this thing up, man, give it out to y'all. And I appreciate y'all as always, man. We got the merch coming. Be on the lookout. 
I got a couple other huge announcements I'm working on, man. It's just taking a little bit longer, you know, a couple moving pieces, you know, we waiting on. But yeah, uh, got some huge news coming soon. Merch is coming. Y'all going to be loving the merch. You know, we're going to be giving a lot, giving away a lot. You know what I'm saying? I'm more excited about giving away some merch than actually selling it, to be honest with you. You know, but that's just how I get down, man. You know, hope you guys have a good day. Hope you guys um, have a great week. Um, I'm going to be trying to bring y'all some more videos. And yeah, man, as always, man, peace. Have a good one.